Okay, let's call this uh, special meeting to order. Let's start with a uh, roll call. Okay, Michelle Anderson. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Byrother. Here. Justin Borgalt. Here. Micah Chappelle. Here. Tony Doan. Here. Damon Doyle. Here. Tom Handy. Here. I, I, sorry, Damon. I got gotcha. you. Tom. Roger Haringa. He said he might be a few minutes late. So Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt. Here. Ty Mincer. Ben Omer. Here. Pete Rieke. Katie Sheehan. Here. So we do have a quorum. And then our ex officio members is Representative Keith Gaynor. Here. Lauren Lathrop. Senator John Lubbock. Here. Representative Alex Rommel. Good morning. Good morning. Senator Linda Wilson. And our assistant attorney, Derek Meyerbachdahl. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Excellent. Thank you, Annette. Um, is there anyone from the public that would like to be recognized? Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, Ty, go ahead. Ty Jennings, Cascade Natural Gas. Thank you, Ty. Tim, go ahead. Tim Atterbury, Associated General Contractors of Washington. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Yes, good morning. This is Kevin Dewell with Northwest Natural. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, Andrea Smith, Building Industry Association of Washington. Thank you. Greg, go ahead. Greg Johnson with Avista. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Lisa Rosno, Evergreen Technology Consulting. We provide tech support for the commercial provisions of the Washington State Energy Code. Excellent, thank you. Thought I missed a hand from but Jason, maybe not. Is there anyone else that would like to be recognized from the public? Jason, go ahead. This is Jason Hudson with IBW Local 77. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette, go ahead. Jeanette McKay with Washington Realtors. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else from the public that would like to be recognized at this time? Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go to agenda item number two, which is review and approve the agenda. So moved. Thank you, Jay. I'll second that. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, let's move to agenda item number three. 2021 Washington State Energy Code Residential and Commercial. We have proposals addressing the possible Federal Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975 preemption uh, based on the recent U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruling and CRA versus City of Berkeley. And Stoyan, as far as the the um, the layout of this, are, are we wanting to take public comment on agenda item as a whole, or how do you want to do this? Agenda item three is the work session uh, for uh, uh, typically for the code adoption. We have one meeting scheduled for the work session and one meeting for the adoption, the vote for the CR one hundred three. In this case, we don't have the entire code. This is the work session. Typically, uh, we don't allow uh, 
another set of testimony because we just completed the uh, comment period and the time for testimony. So this is the time for the council members to discuss the comments and uh, concerns received. And we have uh, X, uh, the public comment column because the council members may have some questions. Understood, okay. Uh, for further clarification, but it's not another period for testimony. Understood, okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay, with that, we'll open it up to the council members for discussion. Uh, Damon, go ahead. Uh, to be clear, are we um, are we going to discuss any potential amendments to the CR one hundred three at this point, or in the next agenda items? Agenda item three, I believe. So th this is the opportunity to discuss any potential amendments. Yes, but again, the vote will be an agenda item four. So the discussion agenda item three, the potential vote and the agenda item four. So we're going to have discussions prior to a motion then. Yep. In other words, a motion wouldn't be in order. That, that's how I'm seeing it, Stoyan, is that, that we're going to deliberate no motions until agenda items four and five. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anything further, Damon, on that? Uh, no, not at the moment. Okay, thank you. Chell, go ahead. I think I guess I'm I'm with David. I'm still unclear about what we're doing now because I I feel like there's there's a bunch of motion or a bunch of mo usually you want a motion before you discuss something and um, I have several amendments that I guess I could suggest for discussion, but there's a lot of them are very minor amendments. There was I don't know maybe. 100 amendments suggested in the public testimony. And I don't know if we want to discuss all the, the little ones or just the big ones. I guess I'm not sure. I, I could go through my my long list of, of minor things and then a couple of major things. I, I'm not sure what, what we're trying to do here. I guess the major ones. I think the idea here would be to maybe um, uh, if there's an idea, if there's a way of communicating what some of those things might be, uh, it, it might be just a good idea to be a little preemptive before jumping into motions. That that might be the idea, Stoyan. Is that what we're looking for? Well, the work session is a work session. There is no vote on it. Uh, Krista, do you want to suggest something different? You spent so much time on these uh, small amendments, and this is the time I think I need to apologize because it appears that based on last-minute uh, emails, we, we missed a few, but it was a huge amount of documents and uh, uh, testimony that uh, the turnaround only a couple of days wasn't wasn't enough. Krista, do you want to, do you want to add something? Uh, basically... This is the time for the council to debate um, or ask questions of anybody if they're unclear on any items in anyone's testimony. Uh, to discuss that among yourselves. If you wish to just go to item number four and uh, start discussion on specific motions, that's your prerogative, but this is the opportunity to make sure that you understand all the testimony presented and um, are clear on the ideas that were stated. So, okay. thank you, Krista. Um, Craig, go ahead. Uh, maybe this is adding more confusion, but we just got an email from uh, Jay Arnold. Would this, this be the time to discuss that? Because I don't know how it fits or where that fits in the agenda. Maybe it's now, maybe it's agenda number four. I don't know. So, I mean, what's the plan to navigate these public <clears throat> for the, the testimony or, or proposed changes coming in now? Typically, the work session is the time, as Krista said, to discuss something that was already received. 
uh, we understand that there may be uh, some new proposals and concern raised, but uh, again, agenda item three, there is not vote associated with it. So you can introduce your proposals during agenda item three, or you can wait and introduce a, a, a particular proposal modification to the original language under agenda item four and have a vote on it. Uh, Jay, go ahead. go ahead. I think the advantage of having this discussion now is maybe the ability to have uh, a walkthrough of some of the major amendments, including um, the one that I've talked about without having the constraints of uh, Robert's rules if if we're developing or deciding on particular um, language. In particular, when I looked at some of the public comment, some of the Coker amendments and um, uh, Olnon and Vanderbay amendments all kind of fit together or, or are duplicative and it might be helpful to uh, hash those out more informally right now. Also, I'm um, available to, if we're at that point, to go into a little more detail of uh, the amendment that I had uh, submitted in public comment and then have specific language that Stoy just forwarded. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Representative Ramel. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I guess if, if I could just offer a suggestion about how we proceed here with the time that we have. What would be helpful for me is to start off with a um, just a quick overview from Derek about what are um, what kinds of amendments are and are not allowed at this stage of the CR 103, because I think we're pretty limited in what we can and can't entertain. Um, and then it might be helpful. It sounds like at least three members here um, have said they've got amendments. I'd be willing to bet there might be more, but it might be helpful if we just kind of go around and let folks who have amendments just announce that those amendments are uh, things they're contemplating um, and kind of get them all on one page. And then, Mr. Chair, maybe you could organize a thoughtful way to go through those amendments once we know what all of them are um, in terms of sort of a work session um, space. That's a lot. Offer that as a way to proceed with what could be a complicated discussion. Thanks. Yeah, understood, Representative Vermel. Thank you. Um, Derek, I don't know if you want to jump in on that now. I think Micah may have something along the same lines. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear from Derek. I think that's a, I was going to say something similar, but I would also maybe uh, get an inclusion from Stoyan on that topic, just to kind of where we started from and what our directives were at the previous meetings to, you know, stay within those parameters, not just, um, you know, hear a bunch of additional amendments. But yes, so start with Derek and maybe from Stoyan on, you know, what was our directive in the CR 102 uh, and go from there. Thanks. Or 101, whichever it was. Thank you. Um, Dirk or Stoyan, do you have any, any insight as far as that goes, as far as what the, um, what's allowed and what's not allowed for amendments? I will pass it to Dirk, and if he doesn't want to wade in, I will do my best and play uh, my role. I don't. Do I have a choice, Stoyan? Uh, well, I not really. Oh yeah, sure not. Okay, so we're at the um, just to establish where we're at on this. The the council and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Stoyan. If if uh, um, if any of this is is not on the right track. We're at, at the stage of the rulemaking process where the council is making a final decision on the proposed rules, and that would be for the purpose of directing um, staff to file a CR 103 um, to uh, adopt rules. And that would, of course, also include requiring a final a filing what those rules say. Um, it is not impermissible for changes to be made to proposed rules right after the CR 102 filing and after the public comment process. Indeed, the public comment process is designed in part, is intended in part to give information to the uh, of a, an agency uh, that would be helpful for them in making determinations on what uh, final rule adoption should look like. Um, sometimes it's a clean adoption. The 
the CR 102 language or the, the rule language that was filed with the CR 102 is, is retained untouched. Uh, but usually there's a few tweaks that are made to it, sometimes substantial changes that are made to it. And the Administrative Procedure Act, Chapter 3405, uh, tells us what needs to happen if there are substantial changes. Now, I want to be careful on what I'm saying here because I don't want to get any of this wrong. So I'm actually going to read from the Administrative Procedure Act if you will indulge me. And that's going to take me uh, an uncomfortable few seconds to pull up the right provision. So bear with me, please. All right. It's called this relevant statutes 3405-340. It provides that an agency may not adopt a rule that is substantially different from uh, the rule proposed in the published notice of proposed rule adoption. That's the CR 102. Uh, if an agency contemplates making a substantial variance from a proposed rule described in a published note notice, it may file a supplemental notice with the code reviser that meets the requirements of 3405-320, that is to file an additional three uh, CR 102, a new CR 102, and reopen the proceedings for public comment on the proposed variance, or the agency may withdraw the rule and start rulemaking from scratch. Um, what is a substantial variance? Well, the APA tells us in subsection two, the following factors shall be considered in determining when an adopted rule is substantially different from a proposed rule. This, the first factor is the extent to which a reasonable person affected by the adopted rule would have understood that the pro published proposed rule would affect his or her interests. The extent to which the subject of the adopted rule or the issues determined in are substantially different from the subject or issues involved in the published proposed rule and the extent to which the effects of the adopted rule differ from the effects of the published proposed rule. So those are, would a reasonable person understand them to be different in, uh, in affecting their interests? Uh, is the subject different and is the effect different? Those are the, the factors that are considered determining whether the variance is substantial. There is an exception, and if you again indulge me for another minute, subsection three of this statute provides that if an agency adopts a rule that varies in content from proposed rule, the general subject matter of the adopted rule must remain as the same as the proposed rule. The agency shall briefly describe any changes other than editing changes and the principal reasons for adopting the changes. That's the concise explanatory statement, which we're all familiar with. The brief description shall be filed with the code revisor office along with uh, the op order of adoption, so along with the CR 103. Within 60 days of publication of the adopted rule in the state register, any interested person may petition the agency to amend any portion of the adopted rule that is substantially different from the proposed rule. The petition shall briefly demonstrate how the adopted rule is substantially different, and so on. So what, what does all that mean? It, it is the exception that says you actually can, uh, a, a rule can vary, CR 103 filing can have be substantially different, right, than the CR 102, but that then triggers a, a right of interested parties to uh, request that the rules be uh, subject to notice and comment. And, uh, you know, what you'll always hear from me is advice is you want to be careful in having a proposed rule look too different because if someone makes that request, then you have to go to new notice and comment rulemaking. In other words, another CR 102 needs to be filed and you need to allow public testimony on that. So those are the limitations we have. I don't know if that's particularly helpful for us to tell you exactly what to do with each proposed change to the rule, but those are that's the what the statute provides. And those are the risks that we're, we would be addressing if uh, the uh, if the council is considering making substantial changes to the proposed language. Thank you, Derek. Um, I, I don't want to step on anyone's hands that are up already, but I do want to make sure that the room is clear on um, Derek's direction there. And so if there's any questions specifically for Derek, let's get those out of the way now. Roger, looks like you have something. Yeah, I uh, apologize for being late. I wanted to make sure I'm uh, accounted for. And Dirk, if you could tell me the number again of that statute so I could look it up and read it myself, I would appreciate Good. it. Yeah, well, that was an easy question. I can do that again. 
It's uh, RCW 34.05.340. And it, if, if you don't mind, there are other considerations. So there is RCW 3405. That's what the APA says, right? And that's the main provision in the APA that we would be uh, looking to assess, you know, risks of uh, substantial changes to the rules. There are also other considerations too, uh, and, and we've we've talked about this in the past, and we've certainly heard from members of the public expressing concerns if there are substantial changes to the rules and there aren't adequate um, cost benefit analysis that is submitted with that. There could be some questions uh, whether. Um, the, the final rules are fully compliant with the requirements under statute uh, and, and some of those other uh, discrete requirements that govern uh, significant uh, rulemaking like, like this. Thank you, Derek. Tom, it looks like you had something for Derek. Yeah, um, you know, when I was reading through all the public comment, it, it looked like kind of an overarching sentiment was to um, skip this code cycle altogether for energy and start working on 24. Um, is that allowed in this part of the process as an option or is that too much of a change? I, I don't understand that. Well, the APA would permit it. So if the agency, if the council rather was uh, elected to not adopt these rules, proposed rules, then you wouldn't adopt these proposed rules. You would need to take the other agency uh, action on the fact that we have a, a current uh, rules that are scheduled to go into effect uh, on uh, in the middle of, of March. And so that would be a, another issue that you would need to deal with. Yeah. Uh, Representative Gaynor, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess my question relates to what Stoyan uh, addressed earlier about some of the comments had not been addressed. So what will those comments be disseminated to, to everyone or what what's happening with uh, that public comment? Do you want me to take that, Stoyan? Yes. They were included in the... Um, list of written testimony received, but some of them did not get included in the list of modifications. And uh, there are some additional documents posted on the website that show the um, modifications that weren't in that summary of modifications, but they so were sent out and posted in the full list of testimony. So they have been addressed. Is that what I'm understanding you say? They have been presented to the council. They won't be addressed until this meeting. So Right. But I mean, they, okay. Uh, Carol, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, skipping this code cycle was not the overwhelming sentiment that there was an influence campaign that flooded our inboxes. We had over 5,000 people in favor of this code when we voted for it to be a final rule over a year ago, about a year ago. We're now providing more options. Skipping it, I think, would be irresponsible. I think the CR 102 language moves us in the right direction, providing clear options for fossil fuel use while maintaining the stringency of the code. Um, there are some thoughtful minor updates to the CR 102 that we received, and I hope we incorporate a bunch of them. There's also some major rollbacks proposed that would move us backwards in terms of energy performance and probably be a substantial difference between the CR 102 and the final rule if we if we incorporated those. Um, I guess that's, that's what I'll say for now. Um, I have a lot more to say as we get further into uh, discussions. Okay. Damon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I sat through all eight hours of oral testimony. I've read all of the written testimony. 98% uh, of respondents have asked for this code to not be adopted. Um, it's, 
of those who testified in favor, nobody came up with calculations, facts, or other than large esoteric reasons for accepting the code. And as uh, somebody said to me in discussion, they said, you know, we're not picking a state flower here. We're putting down a rather rigid building code. As a high performance builder um, for the last 15 years, uh, because I build in rural areas, I've been building all electric for that same amount of time. I've gone through the code in various ways and I cannot comply with the code as written uh, without adding PV. So I'm being forced into solar, which at one point in time we offered as a standard option until solar prices went through the roof due to COVID and supply shortages. So this is probably the worst energy code I've seen since 2006. Um, it's got a lot of holes. The state is eligible for up to half a million dollars in federal funding if we comply with either the 2021 IECC or the 2024 soon to be released. Um, and while there is no clean way to dump this code and move forward, that really would be the best option. Um, my sources at, I, at ICC say the code, the, I, the new 2024 should be out between January and March. I think we could fast track adoption if we didn't overly modify it. The goals of our state set forward in Senate Bill 5854 from 2009, as well as the goals from ICC are mirrored. They're the same. We're looking for net zero by 2031. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm disappointed in the, in the product that we've wound up with. And I think it's gonna cause lots of harm. That's all. Micah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I read through and sat through a lot of the comments and sat through a lot of the, the meetings as well. And I definitely do not see a benefit in skipping the 2021 codes. All the work is done. I'm not sure that that process would be anywhere near efficient to even go back. My understanding is that we've already adopted this code. It has a delayed implementation date, but we would have to go back and readopt the entire 2018 and the 2018 am amendments. Um, Storian can correct me if I'm wrong, so could Deer. But um, I don't think that would be an easy process. At, at the best case scenario, I believe that we could provide some modifications that have been suggested through public comment and written comment, as Chael mentioned, that would very much benefit um, the changes that we're trying to move forward and keep us on track for the 2021 to go into effect. Um, again, I, I would not support at all skipping the 2021. I don't think that's beneficial. 99% of the work for all the 2021 codes have been completed. So, um, we need to move forward with this. I think we can make some modifications. I look forward to the discussion. Katie, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike. I was gonna say a little bit of that. So I'll just say what I, the other part of what I was gonna say is that, you know, this and uh, Chell sort of also alluded to this, the emails that came in were not, that the, they did not address the question that, we were asking for. And so, you know, I appreciate the comments. I listened to them as well. And um, I want to make this the best code that we can. Um, but that was a separate question that was raised independently. We didn't get the other side of it in, in relation to whether or not we should skip the code because that wasn't the question that was put forth to the public. So, um, you know, I, I, I do understand the sentiments and the concern. Um, and I, I, um, but I also think that it was a skewed, uh, portion of the comments that came in on that particular question. And I don't think that we can address it therefore here. Thanks. Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have concerns here about the procedure and what, what we have and haven't done here. Um, 
I was inundated with all kinds of information here of the issues of this process and what, um, as an example, uh, the council has failed to conduct a full cost benefit analysis to give stakeholders the opportunity to review and verify the data that's needed to inform the council's decisions that are related to this, to these energy codes. Um, as well, there's been an issue with the small business economic impact statements. There was a myriad of things that have not been done. So we are, both of these would be violating the APA. And I, I have, um, I have real concerns um, when you look back at uh, what the um, the CRA versus Berkeley, the actual um, litigation that was, or the rules that were uh, litigated, that were in um, this particular ruling, it says in here that uh, by enacting EPCA, Congress ensured that states and localities could not prevent consumers from using covered products. And the way this process has gone, <clears throat> it, it appears that according to the people on the ground, the people that actually use this code in building, there are issues that there cannot be the way the credits have been ro rolled out and all that is still limiting the use of gas through the products. Again, back to uh, CRA versus Berkeley, Congress thus indicated that EPCA preempts building codes like Berkeley's ordinance that function in, in, as energy use regulations. We've got to be concerned about that. We have to be in full compliance. And as it is right now, it, it is not. It's partially, which means it is not in compliance. You cannot be partially in compliant. So we have real issues here that we have to deal with, which is why they're asking to Put, put, put this on hold. We're pushing this thing way too fast. We're doing mental gymnastics to make this thing work and it isn't proper. And so I'm concerned about that when you're talking about the APA and what we're legally legally required to do. Thank you. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think there's some interesting things being said I think regarding cost and, and cost benefit, it, it's kind of a bizarre thing when you, if you have an apple and an orange and you have a cost for each of them and you add a third option to it, um, it, it how do you do a cost benefit on that anyway? Because you are simply providing another option. And if someone's going to go with the lost, low cost option, if the apple was already the low cost option, you choose the apple. If the banana was, you choose the banana, if you, unless you don't like bananas. If you're if the third option is being added and that's a low cost, now you have a new low cost option, but you're not increasing costs by adding options. What the uh, the updated codes do is add an option to more to use fossil fuels, an explicit option in the commercial code. So that <laughs> when you add an option, you're not increasing costs. So that's 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 how I see that. Um, regarding the residential code, uh, there's the R406 system of, of points has a table, and that was the major change in this EPCA response in the CR102. There's a system type table and an energy normalization table in the CR102. If you look at, if you recall last August, we had a CR102 go out as well for the residential code, and that had two options in it. Option one, was very similar to what we have today in the CR-102 from a year ago. Uh, option two was a heat pump uh, mandate, which is what we passed into the final code into the CR-103. The council elected to go with option two into the CR-103. With the EPCA revisions, the current CR-102 table is what we had in option one last August. In fact, the numbers are exactly the same if you look at the energy normalization table and the number of credits required based on home size. Now the BIAW sent a letter last August saying that they preferred option one out of the two options. So we are essentially going from one that the BIAW did not prefer to one that the BIAW did prefer. So it's, it's really interesting now that we hear that you can't meet all the credits. Um, and I've been reading that letter and that, I mean, that's what it says. It does. Of course, it doesn't say that they like either option, but it does say they prefer option one, which is exactly 
what is in the CR102 in, in terms of the energy normalization table and the number of credits required. Uh, so it's interesting to hear that, that cost is coming up uh, for that. So that, that's all for now. Representative Armel. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'd, I'd just flag a, a couple of um, important points for um, recentering this discussion. I guess the first thing I'd, I'd remind folks of is the legislative mandate that we're operating under, under the energy code, to incrementally, periodically improve the energy efficiency of new construction in Washington state. Um, we're working towards a 70% reduction um, in energy consumption in new buildings uh, by 2031. This code moves us steadily um, in the right direction. That's our that's our legislative mandate, and we shouldn't lose sight that that's an important part of what we have been asked to do as a code council. Um, and I think it's important for us to remain on track with that as well. With regards to questions about the process uh, and procedure underlying the adoption of this code, I guess I would just remind folks uh, that you know, we've got Derek carefully um, at attentive to these proceedings. And in my time on this council, when we've uh, misstepped on process or started uh, to misstep at all on process, Derek has been there um, verifying that we're on um, to make sure that we stay on track and in compliance with the um, Administrative Procedures Act and all of our other requirements. I am um, I'm not concerned that we're in violation if Derek is not uh, concerned that we're in violation and jump in Derek anytime um, I'm misstating. Uh, I, I'm uh, sure I'll jump in. Uh, I appreciate the, your kind words, Representative Rommel, and, and uh, you know we we work really hard to make sure that the uh, council and all of our clients are on track. Um, uh, well, I guess what all I would say to that is there's always risk. Right. And, and on the procedural side, on the substantive side, when an agency uh, takes action under the APA, it is a by definition a procedural act and there are prescriptive procedural requirements. So I don't want anybody here to think that uh, there isn't always risk attendant to actions that we take. I want to take, you know, I want to honor uh, Senator Wilson and the concerns that that she's identified and, and that other folks have identified with respect to um, the process. Um, you know, again, we, we do our best in the attorney general's office to, to provide advice to keep people on track at the end of the day. Uh, obviously, it's the council that makes needs to make determination as to whether or not they're uh, tolerant of those risks and, and take appropriate steps uh, to, to move policy forward. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, with, with those with those two points, I guess I'd just ask that, you know, we've got four hours together here today um, to work on improving these energy codes before we advance them. I feel like conversation about whether we should adopt the 2021 energy code at this point are um, a misdirection of our effort. We do have some real opportunity to make some incremental improvements based on substantive public comments that we've received. And I just urge the council to spend the limited time that we have today focused on how do we get those incremental improvements so that we can pass the best thing um, rather than should we or should we not. Damon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, three things. First of all, uh, just to respond to some of the comments made, I've always wanted to say this to the fine gentleman from the 40th district, the uh, <laughs> The uh, the PNNL report showed that we had gone 18.8% beyond what our target was for the 21 code. So we've made a huge step forward. In fact, we're two code cycles ahead of where we need to be. And in analyzing the code, I find it to be too restrictive to comply with. Uh, we've made too far of a jump and I think we need to make some fixes. Uh, regarding Shell's comments on the BIW letter, we chose the option two route when we eliminated uh, gas space heating and gas water heating in the last hour of the last tag meeting. So we never fully analyzed the option one, the, the table 4, 406 credits that we're looking at today. 
And I've gone all sorts of different directions to figure out how to meet compliance with, with these things. And I, it, we've, we've made it too limited. Okay. Lastly, um, there are some, some good suggestions that have been made by members of the public. So before we move on from this agenda item, I think it'd be worthwhile to be able to address some of them individually and let them respond uh, to clarify their recommendations. So I'm hoping we get a chance to do that before we move on. Thank you. Jay, go ahead. I want to echo some of the comments that Representative Rommel ha had made. Our original direction here was that we have an adopted energy code. We have some potential legal risk with EPCA. We entered a rulemaking to make some minor revisions to better uh, to clarify things, to better comply with EPCA. Uh, that's what we have on the table today. And I'd like to move on to that discussion because there are some substantive amendments that I'd like to understand better and, and um, focus on uh, the original mandate that we had set off beginning in September. And I'm wondering the best way to get there. I'm prepared to make a motion if we need to put this to a vote or if if our deliberations are headed in that direction anyway. I'd like to talk about amendments. Thank you. All right, Wilson. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess I would just like to say that uh, one thing is we're still on target to meet the code without this code. So we don't have to have this code in, our, in order for us to be reaching what um, the legislation said. Secondly, I'd like to know where is the cost benefit analysis standard at the at the at the building code council? What is the standard? And then um, the other thing is, um, I know that was just said that there was only an option added, but when you change the requirement, and so you change the number of credits across all the, the system types by three in your residential table here, that's one and a half to two times increase. So you're not just adding an option, you're changing the rules to add that option. So we, I'm just, we gotta be here honest about what's happening on this in, in what we're doing. And we still have to comply with EPCA across the board, not just one piece of it, but all of it. Otherwise we're wide open to litigation again. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I guess uh, to Jay's point, how do we decide to move on to the next agenda item? I'm not sure I wa wanted to move to the next agenda item if it's more efficient to talk informally about the amendments versus um, formal motions. Yeah, if you don't, uh, I'm going to take Representative Rommel's words to heart and, and come in as the procedure cop here um, uh, and just say something real quick. And, and I think maybe I should have said this at the beginning of this meeting. This is a special meeting uh, of the council. And accordingly, uh, the council doesn't have a lot of latitude to take action outside of the items that are on the agenda. So I just want to make sure that we're mindful of that as, as we move forward. I'm not necessarily concerned with motions being made uh, to, to move on to, to the next discussion. Uh, although I would note that the agenda um, item that we're in right now is a work session and um, we need to be mindful that, that that's the, what the public has been told is the purpose of this first part of the meeting. Amen, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the letters that we received in writing was some from uh, Kai Jennings, Cascade Natural Gas. And he brought the very first part of his letter is on the small business economic impact statement. Um, I wonder if Ty could clarify that for us. I'm I'm, I'm a little a little confused and and uh, want to know how we got to where we got. Okay, Ty, are you available? Okay, I see your hand up. See if we can get your microphone going. Okay, Ty, you should be able to talk now. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Damon. Thank you, Chair. Um, for those that have read my letter that I prepared and provided to the staff, I do point out that the uh, under the APA and the Regulatory Fairness Act, 
A small business economic impact statement is required as part of the CR 102 filing. Per section three of the CR 102 filings provided in uh, the WSR, it includes a listing of industries that are required to comply with the energy code. It also includes a minor cost estimate that is comparative to the industry's 1% of average annual payroll and 0.3% of the average annual gross business income. By review, it appears that the values provided within this table, the table included in the CR 102, may have not been prepared in conformance with the Regulatory Fairness Act, nor reflect a representative sampling of business or trade associations. The values provided as the minor cost estimate are exactly, and I mean exact, to the penny, the same as either the 1% of average annual payroll or 0.3% of average annual gross business income. Basically, your estimate matches exactly what the limit is to the penny. That doesn't appear that it was an estimate. That appears that you took your upper limit and said, that, that's what it is. Not only does it match exactly there, it matches exactly back to the November actions um, that were underdone prior to this EPCA rebalance. So I, I don't see any data. It just appears that values were copied and pasted over. Damon, go ahead. Perhaps uh, the tag chair and Chell could remind me. When did we review the small business impact portion when we were looking at the changes to the rule? I don't, I don't recall that during the tag. Was it was it ever reviewed by the council or the tag or our committee? Uh, Storian, would you like me to address this? Yes, please. I was just uh, writing your message if you can do that. Okay, so this information um, in the table is actually straight from um, Araya, the uh, people who put together the small business impact uh, forms and tables and information. And that table is just showing it's actually taken directly from ARIA and just shows what the limits are. It is not a statement of what the costs are for this measure. Uh, those costs are then later detailed in the text below that. This table just shows what the cutoffs are. So of course it would match it to the penny because we're not gonna go into their table and uh, change those numbers. And ARIA, did not update the numbers until I think last week they came out with revisions to the 2021 numbers that were there. And those are all extracted directly from LNI and uh, tax records for those types of companies. So um, That just shows what the threshold is, and then you have to go in and read the report to see what the impacts are. Uh, most of them were indeterminate because there are a myriad of different options. So the table is not stating what the cost of those are to those business. The, that table is only showing what the cutoff is and Araya selects the smaller number of either the 1% or the 0.3% uh, uh, gross on the gross business income. Sorry, that was a little garbled. I'm not sure that answered the question. He asked where the numbers came from, and I no, explained when it was where discussed. those number, numbers came from. Yeah, I think it was when we discussed it. That would have been at the TAG meeting when we were reviewing the proposals, 
and the economic statements that were um, submitted with those proposals. Thank you, Krista. Tom, do you have something? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to follow this, and I wasn't here for the entire initial process only since April, but it almost sounds to me, and I've been to every meeting that there was, except for maybe one or two, but it sounds almost like this cost-benefit analysis wasn't really completed all the way. You know, I mean, it seems like the thresholds were were laid out there, but then there wasn't really the study done to fill in the actual data. And so if there is all of that somewhere with the current code language included, I'd sure like to be able to see that. Uh, Tony, can I clarify this? Yes, go ahead. So we are mixing up a little bit the cost benefit analysis with the small business economic impact statement. Tom, I think I sent you an email a couple of days ago with the links how uh, and where the numbers came from. And the cost benefit analysis is something else. We put together the preliminary cost benefit analysis. Uh, we have it available on the, on the uh, website. Uh, and the cost benefit analysis, preliminary cost benefit analysis is based on the data submitted by the proponents. And it's based on the additional information uh, that was uh, discussed at the technical advisory group, if something was discussed. So we have the preliminary cost benefit analysis. The final cost benefit analysis is developed after the final language is adopted because many of these sections still get, still get changed. So the, the small business economic impact statement is a different requirement based on a different statute. And I was mixing those up. You're right. And I was more addressing the small business aspect of it. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, public comment at this time has to be initiated by a request from um, Council members, Damon, did you have, go ahead. Yeah, it looks like Ty had a, a follow-up comment. So okay. it, was his, it was his suggestion that uh, was the genesis of this. I'd love to hear it. Sir, Ty, go ahead. Yes, thank you. My apologies. I didn't know if it was in order for me to, to respond to Krista, but uh, in her comment, um, I, I'm looking right now currently at the, the filing the CR 102, I'm on page seven. I see the table that I referred to where it, it, it indicates the minor cost estimate. Krista had indicated that that was just the low, lesser of the two. It, it, it appears to be the greater of the two in most cases here. Um, and then she indicated that it was further discussed beyond that, however, in the document that I am reviewing, there is no discussion that follows said table. Um, I'm looking at page seven and eight right now, and that's where the document ends. So again, I, I ask, where is the small business economic impact cost? Because what I see in the table is a minor cost estimate that matches exactly to the penny of the 1% of average annual payroll or the 0.3 of average annual gross business income. And again, I, I see the, the header of the table saying minor cost estimate. I don't see any other discussion, calculation um, that is indicative of the impact to small business. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Sorry. I was going to ask Krista if she wants to add something to it or not. Mm -hmm. um, well, as it says in that list of industries, below is a list of industries required to comply with the Commercial Energy Code and includes the minor cost threshold as reported by ARIA. So that minor cost estimate is the threshold set by ARIA, not the cost of the code. And... 
I'm not finding. You're correct. I'm not finding where the, there was another paragraph. that should be in that small business economic impact statement section. Oh, it's just under professional services. Let's see. And, uh, the cost of compliance for small business, that statement there. So that is above that table is the actual small business economic impact statement. Thank you, Krista. Okay, I'll go ahead. I guess since we're talking about what we might want to modify the the list that I have of things that I would modify include updating the effective year uh, for um, for the old known letter uh, for the commercial code um, updating per Ty Jennings letter the C five hundred three point four point six from 10% to 5%. Um, another Ty Jennings one, the change in C406.1.2, uh, where occupancy group is less than 10% of the floor area. The project uses a primary group for those credits. Um, there's a update to the electrical electrification readiness, C401.3.6, uh, based on the Olin letter. Um, there's uh, some things in the uh, Johnny Cooker letter, uh, amendments one through five, and then adding the uh, high efficiency water heating into from option two into option one for gas fired uh, high efficiency water heating. And then amendment seven as well with some, uh, I think the, the Nillis Equation language is is great, uh, but there was a, a simpler way to to write the equation. It's just it's the same equation. It's just a simpler way to write it. Um, and then another thing from uh, the Olin letter. So those are those are the ones for the commercial code that I was going to suggest changes to, and then uh, updating the HSPF two values, uh, because that's the the way things are tested now. Uh, a typo that's fixed, and then the R405 baseline system, setting that to uh, be a minimum, federal minimum heat pump water heater instead of a tier one NIA advanced water heater. So those are the things that I was going to suggest would be changed based on uh, the public comment that, that came in. Actually, no, there's, there's a, a couple of things that are not in uh, this one. There's uh, in C503.5, um, and C3503.4.6, these are alterations, uh, uh, existing building alterations. Uh, it's not clear that you can use the fossil fuel compliance path, so adding language to those sections, um, and I can send that language soon, that would um, make it clear that the fossil fuel path is available in those uh, existing building uh, sections for alterations. So those are the those are the modifications I plan on suggesting. Uh, um, and then I talked to Ben about a lot of the uh, Eric Olman suggestions as well of being more minor and, and editorial as well. And I think he sent a list to Krista of, of those. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Any comments or questions for Chael on those modifications? Okay. 
All right, would anyone else like to bring forward any of their um, proposals for the next agenda items? Jay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the language that I have is in C501.1, existing buildings. There was a, a bill that passed the legislature, House Bill 1042, that allowed changes to existing commercial and multifamily buildings and allow for conversion to residential um, without adding a bunch of requirements. Uh, some of those requirements are on local government saying that we can't uh, up parking requirements and, and other things. And then there was language in there that said that the State Building Code Council would adopt uh, changes to the energy code that waives the requirement for unchanged portions of an existing building uh, used for residential purposes to meet the energy code because of the solely for the dwelling units in the new building. Krista took this legislative mandate and there was a staff recommendation of a change in 501.1 that went out for public comment. I have uh, a minor change in that language because uh, House Bill 1042 defined existing building as something that had had a certificate of occupancy for at least three years. Uh, the goal is to allow for conversion of spaces for an existing building, not allow a loophole for a building to be permitted and uh, built under uh, commercial standards and then uh, immediately be um, converted. So I wanted to reflect uh, the specific definition for existing building in that particular code. And that's where you've got the changes um, on uh, the screen that would be a minor change to what staff had recommended. Thank you, Jay. Any, before I go to Ben, any questions or comments related to Jay's? And Ben, did you have something related to Jay's amendment? No, I had something separate. Okay, we'll, we'll get to you. Uh, uh, Micah, go ahead. I just had a comment on Jay's proposal. It looks like you're adding the word converted to. I don't believe that's in the legislation. It talks about existing residential uses that are unaltered, not spaces that were converted to residential uses in the prior three years. It, it just, the way you've written it, I agree with part of it, but other parts of it, I don't. I, I do see where you're trying to go, but I think you should um, eliminate the converted to portion of your change um, and stick with the used for residential purposes. And, and I believe that residential purposes um, or purposes needs to be added back in. Um, it just says residential, but that's my well, comment. Uh, Thank you, Jay. I appreciate the comment. Thanks. Uh, Roger, go ahead. I think my comment is the same. Um, if you're converting a building to a residential use, I would assume that you would have to meet the energy code if you are an existing residential building, and um, then then you don't need to up, update the whole thing. So I think that I think that Micah's comment addresses what my question was. Okay. The um, and just as a clarification, I, in talking to some of the uh, folks that were advocates of this, it's not necessarily the full conversion of existing buildings. Uh, they were looking for opportunities to do things, say, in a multifamily building where there's ground floor retail or common space to have some options to convert those to residential um, versus some of them, uh, the work to convert a full residential building, which would be great uh, as a housing solution, but wanted to think about the broad set of uh, potential here. Thank you. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Do you have anything further? Okay. Chay, I'll go ahead. Um, Eric Vandermeer, the, late this morning, uh, brought up that section 505.3 conflicts with that. So I think I, I really don't know what to do about it. I'm noodling on some language now, but um, C505.3 suggests that anything converted to a residential requires full compliance with the code, which 
I think there's there's a couple ways of looking at that, and it's not clear to me uh, what the response is to that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Wilson, did you have something with Jace? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Patrick Hanks with Vista can, would like to speak to this. We can invite him on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm actually with uh, Washington Policy Center, and I wanted to uh, explain uh, my public testimony on the small business economic uh, impact statement. I'm, I understand we kind of moved that a little bit, but I thought um, the comments that I made weren't addressed. So is it okay if I comment on that and go back to that? This is not in relation to Jay's proposal then? No, it is not. Okay. Let me, Patrick, we will get to you. I'm going to take Ben's comment because his hand's been up and then we're going to jump right back to you. Okay, Patrick? And then yeah. we'll, we'll jump back into that small business impact. Okay. Ben, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I Jell mentioned uh, a bunch of the editorial items that I had highlighted for um, inclusion. I, I wanted to mention one other thing. Um, I was recommending uh, the editorial items that Eric Vandermeer had um, proposed. Uh, one of the items which I think might be worthy of additional discussion is um, change to the electrical readiness section in C401.3.6 where Eric had proposed removing the word utility from item four um, for uh, different electrical um, gear and items that would need to be provided due to um, potential um, situations on large campuses um, or other, other facilities like that where the electrical distribution might be um, not directly from a utility. So I, I think it made sense to do that, but I'm curious if any uh, other council members had other questions for uh, either for Eric, I see he's on the uh, attendees, or um, wanted to discuss. I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Is there anything, um, is there any council members that would like to speak to uh, Ben's email here on the screen and his comments? We can always circle back to that too if there's none right away. Let's take uh, Patrick's public comment um, initiated yep. by Senator Wilson and then we can come back to that. So Patrick, go ahead. Yes, so um, the, the issue that Pai was talking about in his public comment, I noticed that initially and I think that's an issue where because the way that it's formatted, it's confusing and it it's easy to think that the thresholds that are being reported in the list of industries table, that that's the estimate that they're claiming. Um, if you look at the uh, Excel tool from ORIA that they used for that, um, they are, you know, I think your staff said that they just used that to report on it. And that, that looked about right to me. One of the things I was concerned about was that in that Excel tool, the staff does have to put in a cost estimate um, in order to get that list of industries information that they got. And that cost estimate that they used was not reported on. But then to go to the public testimony that I submitted, there's a list of very specific things that the Small Business Economic Impact Statement must include according to RCW Title 19, Chapter 85, Section 40. And some of those elements are highly specific and entirely missing, in particular, subsection 1A through C, which is a, a comparison of the cost of compliance for small businesses with the cost of compliance for the 10% of businesses that are the largest um, required to comply, and that it uh, uses at least one of the following for comparing costs, cost per employee, cost per hour of labor, or cost per $100 of sales. That is nowhere in the Small Business Economic Impact Statement for both the commercial and residential uh, statements. Um, it does have a table where uh, staff has put an estimation of cost for each provision, and I believe the calculation is what it would cost per dwelling. 
but that's not what the statute requires. Um, so I was just hoping that we could hear from uh, if if the procedure lease is still on, if they could comment looking at uh, Section 40 of Title 19, Chapter 85, and looking at the Small Business Economic Impact Statement, because from what I read it, it's it's clearly not in full compliance with the statute. Patrick. Damon, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one of the items I hope to bring up when it's time, when a motion is in order, is uh, an objection to uh, item number nine on the CR 103, which was the editorial change from 0 0.056 walls to 0 0.045. Um, I've got a variety of reasons against uh, where I, I struggle with that. Um, so I, I'll just throw it out there as something we'll touch on when it's time to consider all these amendments. Thank you, Dana. Okay, anything further from council members for agenda item three? Is there any other discussion we would like to have during this work session before we move on? Micah, go ahead. I just want to point out that we should still look at modifying or removing section C401.3.6. That's still in the CR um, 102. And that is. We lost you, Micah, unfortunately. Mike, I don't know if you want to try that again. You cut out about halfway through that. I apologize. Is that a little better? Turn the video off. Yes. Okay. I uh, just wanted to, um, as part of our deliberations, remind us that we should, or at least in my opinion, remove section C401.3.6 as for electrification readiness. I believe that exceeds the scope of what we were tasked to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion for this agenda item? Okay, very good. Let's move to agenda item number four, which is going to be the 2021 Washington State Energy Code commercial, the CR 103. Uh, vote and final adoption. Uh, Chael, go ahead. Yeah, I'll make a motion to get us started, and then people will make amendatory motions, I'm sure. So the motion will be to adopt the CR 103, uh, adopt the CR 102 commercial energy code into the CR 103 rulemaking process uh, using option one uh, in the CR 102 with the following uh, responses to public comments and modifications. Um, this includes uh, the updating the effective date on it, of course, um, updating C503.4.6 uh, footnote B from 10% to 5% per Ty Jennings language. Uh, it includes the things on the screen that I can I can read for you if you want. Um, C406.1.2, uh, which is a uh, uh, Ty Jennings letter, I think that clarifies it. Um, and then I had one more, uh, I think, modification in there from all to those. Uh, the electric and electrification readiness that uh, Micah just talked about, revised number one to read slightly different um, as per uh, Eric Olnan. Um, then uh, per the uh, Coker letter, uh, uh, including amendments one through five, uh, as they read in the letter. Um, and then using the option one table, but adopting uh, the high efficiency gas water heating credits and reference language 
which is option 19 and the option 2, C406.2, parentheses 2, as well as an editorial updating the HVAC control reference in that table. Um, and then Amendment 7 in the Coker letter uh, using the Nellis equation language. Uh, I finally understand, understand it. I couldn't understand it earlier. Um, and then I, I modified the, the way the uh, equation is written, and that's um, that's to make it simpler to understand. Uh, and then for the uh, Eric Olin letter, uh, 503.4 change, or, or clarify it by adding, instead of this section, this section, and, and put the section number in there. Um, and so the next one is residential. So I, this is about the commercial. So I'm making this motion to make these changes. Um, and then there's two additional ones that I need to send to Chris and I'll, I'll make those later as an amendment to my motion. So that's my motion to pass that, pass CR 102 into CR 103 with the listed modifications. And I guess I'll also include the modifications that Ben had, which are largely editorial, but nonetheless will help Washingtonians use the code. Mr. Chair, I'll second that. And I'm wondering if staff could forward us Shell's document. Um, there, I want to compare the list of uh, changes that he's proposing in this amendment to my own notes. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Chell, I I'm going to ask that you that you please have something typed up that I can repeat the motion before vote because I, I can't even get the motion off of closed captioning with the way it's stated. It, it, that's going to be extremely difficult to have a full understanding that's so broad that I'm gonna need something typed up in order for us to efficiently do that. Okay, would the, um, the uh, if Krista sends out what I sent her, would that be adequate or? As long as it includes what Ben's comments are, and you know, it sounds like you're going to have some amendments. So this is going to get pretty yep. complicated. Yep, I will send the what what Ben sent, what I have uh, in a single email to. Well, I guess Krista could probably send that out. Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, okay, we'll open it up for discussion. Um, Cheryl, would you like to speak to that motion first? Yes, yes, I would. I think I read through the letters and I saw some kind of misunderstandings in the letters. Um, and I'd like to address those. Uh, I think I, I was really appreciative of, of some of the letters, especially the McDonald Miller letter that, that talks about, that got into the weeds with the code and, um, uh, provided some good good ideas. Uh, the AGC letter, uh, I think, you know, it highlights the opinions of one judge. Um, and the Washington codes do not ban gas piping or gas appliances. So, uh, you know, that then I'm going to state this again and again because it's true and it's misunderstood in, in every oppositional letter. The reason why fossil fuel appliances need to get additional credit is because they are not an efficient use of energy compared to a heat pump. APCA clearly states that, or suggests that building codes can regulate energy use and suggests that it's evaluated on a one-to-one -one basis. Heat pumps are very efficient, while burning fossil fuels is not very efficient. For a one-to-one -one basis, we need to consider that heat pumps are two, three, or four times more efficient at heating over the course of a year. And since 20 or 30% of residential energy use is heating, if you use a heat pump, you're a lot of the way there towards meeting uh, an energy performance standard. If you use, if you burn fossil fuels and it's in an inefficient appliances, you have to do lots and lots of other things to meet the same one-to-one -one efficiency. So the argument AGC appears to be making is that it costs more to build a building that uses natural gas that meets energy standards. And that's probably true, uh, but that's not, but APCA says that that doesn't have to be, you know, that doesn't prohibit that. Um, we're, you know, the council doesn't decide what natural gas costs or what appliances cost, but in a one-to-one -one energy use, uh, it, it just takes a lot more to get a fossil fuel building to a certain energy standard. That's physics. 
Um, but somehow the fact that it costs more to build a fossil fuel heated building that meets our legislator required energy efficiency targets, that, that's not saying that gas is banned. That's, um, that's it's just incorrect. Um, and we've really in the past been penalizing heat pumps because they are efficient. We've actually been making gas homes do less and heat pump homes do more just to meet our energy efficiency targets. If you look at the reports we submit to the legislature each year, they, they clearly state that, that we're actually requiring more and more efficiency out of our heat pumped homes and, and less of our fossil fuel homes. So this actually gets it closer to a one-to-one -one energy use, which is what EPCA suggests we need to do. Um, there, I can respond to other letters. In the letter, uh, Nustorf letter, the resiliency of our electricity grid calls the grid fragile. Um, the letter is very, the way the letter reads is very different than the report reads that's cited in the letter. If you actually read the report, uh, the Pacific Northwest is actually in the green, uh, meaning they have almost no uh, power outages according to the letter that's cited in the Nussdorf report. The only periods, and these are periods with less than two hours a year of, of issues, um, the only times are in the summer. So the arguing that a uh, an electric uh, heat pump device is going to fail in the winter, the actual report cited in the Nussdorf letter suggests that the only potential issues are in the summer, and they're less than two hours a year. Lots of other places around the country are in the red, meaning they have over two hours a year of power outages, um, but not the Pacific Northwest. So that's kind of um, you know misleading. Uh, and then I want to also cite a letter by Mark Bossler, uh, a doctor. Low-income communities and communities of color are exposed to far worse pollution indoors and out than white wealthy communities. Access to cooling is also a health and equity issue. Electric heat pumps inc increase climate resiliency by, by providing life-saving co cooling and air filtration as heat waves and wildfires intensify in our region. Um, so I, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying in, in support of my motion. Thank you, Jay. That's the second. Do you have anything? Okay. Thank you. Mike, go ahead. First, I want to thank Chell for so much work and all the others, but I know Chell put in a lot of time and effort and, and Ben as well recently. So I, I know this is uh, complex, so I appreciate the time. I want to support Shell's motion. However, with the exception of any modification to C401.3.6, that section needs to be struck out entirely. Um, I would like to make a modified motion to do so. The reason being is that it doesn't or would increase cost. This is saying that you need to provide number two on the list says provide spare electrical service entrance conduits. So in other words, you got to put in your service conduit and you got to put in an extra for a possible upgrade in the future. That's additional cost. Uh, it also says that you have to have additional accommodations for utility equipment comp comprised of transformers or other equipment necessary. Again, additional cost that you don't even know the size, the need. It's all speculation. I believe this section needs to be struck. It goes beyond the scope of what we were tasked to do and adds new requirements with additional cost. I support the rest of it, and I know that um, the cost-benefit analysis, certain things may not be there that to some extent people are talking about, but I agree with Chell that this is providing options, so it's not modifying the cost. However, Section C401.3.6 is a shall be required for new construction, which adds costs and needs to be struck through. I will make a modified or a, a second motion, or I guess it's another motion, to strike CO4, C401.3.6 from the modifications that Chell has suggested. Thank you. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Micah, you spoke to that amendment, unless you have anything further. No, I will not add to that. Thanks. Okay. Um, Damon, do you have anything to add? No, I do not. Okay. Is there any discussion on the amended motion? Um, ben, go ahead. 
Uh, Chair, just a question. Do I, is the discussion right now within the amended motion? I, I wanted to speak to the original motion. I believe we have to take care of the amended motion at this time. Okay. On the table, so we can, uh, I can come back to you, Ben. All right. I'll hold my comment. Roger. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to get the right number, but um, my question to Micah is, was that section in the code that we adopted a year ago? Or is this a change that got added between a year ago and what we're proposing today? I can step in. It was not in the code a year ago. Okay. Thank you. Todd, go ahead. Yes, thank you. And I... Um... You know, speaking to that question, Roger, you know, I, I go um, both ways on this because it was added back in when the change was made to, um, of course, um, incorporate uh, fossil fuel production. So, so it technically would have been in there because it would have been required as part of the systems that were required in the previous code. So, I, I guess I, I'm just curious with the council, I'd like like to, you know, discuss this a little more and and, and better understand what position the council should take on this. Um, because how much of this is that we we do need to um, think of our buildings, you know, on a fifty to hundred year time frame when other systems, while they're allowed now, will be obsolete. You know, so when we're talking about fossil fuel systems that uh, you know are already trending to to move away, where will we be in ten to thirty years? And should our buildings that are going to last longer be ready to incorporate them? So. That's that's where I'm torn, and would like to hear more from the rest of the council and and take an up down vote on this. Um, so thank you, uh, Jay. Go ahead. Yeah, but I echo uh, Roger and uh, Todd's comments from a policy standpoint. I support this policy of uh, electrification, and was disappointed that it wasn't part of our original uh, energy code. However, our discussion today is about EPCA and EPCA adjacent changes needing to reduce our legal risk. And I'm having a hard time connecting this particular policy, which I support, to that particular direction that we're doing. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Craig, you're on mute. You know, someday I'll get that right the first time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, for both correcting me and letting me speak, even when I wasn't. First of all, I, I agree with the comments made that Chell has done an amazing job, and I appreciate the depth with which he has chased this uh, to get to it. I have a concern, but there's just now too much to digest, you know. Uh, he's done a great job line that I would take me, I would like to look at this for a couple of days rather than be rushed through a vote today. I think there's just so much and it's probably good. I've always trusted chill in the, in the past, uh, but there's just so much uh, to digest. Uh, I'd like to also hear from the writers of the letters that he's mentioning to confirm that the adjustments he has made address the concerns that they had because there, there was, as I read through these things, there were a lot of very intelligent people with a lot of concerns and I'm just not sure that Pick, going through it like that addresses there. So they, I, mean, I don't know if there's an opportunity for them to address that. And finally, I think any additional cost mandated by code is in effect a ban on gas. Whether we have multipliers or different things like that, if there is something that says it's more expensive to do it that way because it's mandated by code, that is in effect a ban. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Vermel. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, speaking to Micah's proposed amendment, I guess I just really want to highlight that long term, this is likely to be a cost savings in these buildings and even medium term, this is likely to be a cost savings in these buildings. It is much less, you know, I don't need to tell anybody on this council how much less expensive it is um, to put in wiring um, while the building's going up as opposed to retrofitting later, um, how much less expensive it is to put in the right sized panel um, at the beginning rather than uh, hiring an electrician um, to retrofit later. Um, if those are costs that we reasonably anticipate are coming and uh, we know that the direction 
uh, we are headed is towards increased electrification. If those costs are pending, um, I believe this is smart policy. Um, whether it fits neatly in the scope of the amendments we're proposing today, I think is an important question. I guess I understood the um, the scope of the amend um, the changes that we're looking at today to be allowing increased use of gas in some cases, but we ought to mitigate that, knowing that the long term, um, the those gas appliances are likely to be obsolete, and we want those building owners, those homeowners, and commercial businesses to be able to um, easily make that and inexpensively make that transition. I think it's good policy. Um, and so speaking against the amendment. Thanks. Thank you. Micah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and again, I, I the comment was made that this would have been required if the equipment was installed. And you're correct. That sizing would be based on the equipment need for today. We're speculating on what technology will require in the future. Jay also made the point that we're struggling, and I'm struggling as well, to how do we tie this in with the EPCA issues that we're addressing? This is something new. And, and again, this is assuming that technology won't improve. If a house is provided with a 200 amp service that say needs a two inch or even two and a half inch conduit run to it, um, that may be good enough in the future. We don't have that answer based on new improvements in technology. However, the, the language says that that wouldn't be enough, that you have to provide a spare conduit. So you're adding costs that you may never even need based on what could be existing already. Again, I think this, this isn't necessarily the right direction for policy based on speculation. I understand where we're trying to get with this, but again, I think you're going a step beyond the EPCA issues and we're basing this on speculative sizing in the future when it may not be necessary and thus it is an added cost because it is a required spare, not the required for the installed equipment like it previously was in the code um, before we made modifications. Thanks. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, everyone. That's that, that's the help I needed. I, I think it's a yes to everyone. Everyone's right in this in this case. Um, I think I, I'll also support this I, because I think it was already in there and, and as part of the EPCA revisions, this is simply now calling this out that was already in, in, inherent to it. And, and the other side of where I think I support this is, is that when we think of a cost benefit um, analysis to this, uh, you know, the heat pump systems we have to remember were the lowest cost to achieve a certain benefit. And I know that we have to keep reminding ourselves that that while we're then allowing the opportunity for a fossil fuel system for the next 10 to 20 years, again, that will simply just lose. And that because it's not the most cost effective solution to get to that benefit. So I'll uh, I'll gently support this. Thank you. Hi, go ahead. Um, so I strongly support this policy. And I guess for me, I would have to hear that by including it, we'd be clearly and unequivocally crossing some legal line. And, and based on all the comments I've heard so far, I'm not hearing that or I'm not able to really ascertain that. So if someone wants to articulate that for me, then that'd be helpful. Thanks. Damon, go ahead. Thank you. I, I think it's important to note that this did not go through the first tag nor the second tag. This is a, an 11th hour add to this. So I would support the motion and, and strike that, that portion. Matthew, go ahead. All right. Um, so I would oppose the, this this motion. I mean, putting in those those futures is what we call them in the electrical industry. Uh, having those spare conduits there provides flexibility for the homeowner, whether it be an EV or an RV charging station or uh, even a mini split ductless type system. It gives you flexibility as a homeowner uh, to what to do with that spare. Uh, it might cost hundreds, but it's going to save you thousands. So I would oppose that just for the sake of the homeowner. Thank you. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, just to clarify, um, 
because we're saying support and oppose. Right now, the amendment is to strike section 401.3.6 out of out of this package. So I oppose the amendment, but support including it. Thanks. Damon, go ahead. The curiosity, uh, doesn't this fall under L and I and not not the energy code or the IRC? This is an electrical provision. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Micah, did you have something on that? Yeah, I think that depends on if your jurisdiction has an electrical program. Um, I, I, we went with this whole discussion previously on the EV, but based on legislation, it's in the building code. Uh, again, I think that uh, the comments have been that LNI is going to look at whatever electrical installation is installed, but this just goes beyond what we should be doing. I, I, I Again, I support this amendment, but I think it's out of line with what we were tasked to do. Thanks. Uh, Chael, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. One, this is in the commercial code. It would apply to uh, multifamily buildings with uh, enclosed corridors and, and all commercial buildings, but not single family or, or townhome residential. Um, the other is that it was discussed at the tag level. And I, I think at the some language was brought forward to improve the electric readiness uh, within the tag. Um, so it, it was discussed at the tech level. Micah, go ahead. Since it was discussed at the tech level, Chell, was there discussions on how the size for the equipment is, is calculated? What is that based on? This states that it's going to be sized to support all heat pump appliances. Which appliances are those specifically? Because a dishwasher is an appliance, and that's maybe a stretch. However, the language states all appliances to support all heat pump appliances. Again, I, I guess the language is just not clear, and, and hopefully we can move to the vote on this, but uh, it doesn't need to be included. It's the wrong time for this amendment, even if it is supported by policy. Um, thanks. Yeah, since you asked me a direct question, um... Sizing is not my my expertise of electric equipment. Um, I'll just play the architect card on that. Um, it was discussed, and I think that's why we had some modified language going through there. Um, I feel like one of the letters included something about listing the appliances and clarifying that it was, um, I think, space and water heating. But uh, I... I don't have that readily in front of me. Sorry about that. No worries. Thank you. Again, additional modifications that would need to be made to this for clarification is another reason why we should strike it. Any further discussion? Uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to re recall back on these discussions, and it seems to me, my recollection is that we did discuss it and possibly at a at one of our meetings, the SBCC meetings, uh, because I recall making a motion to strike it that died due to the lack of a second, and I couldn't have been able to do that because I'm not a voting tag member or committee member, so I, that's just where my memory's going on this. Well, yeah. just to respond to Micah, so in Amendment 4 in the Coker letter, it is, that, that was part of my main motion, it says, it clarifies for each fossil fuel space heating or service water heating appliance installed. So that is part of the main motion, is to clarify the appliances to just space or water heating appliances. Did you say installed? Accommodate those installed. It says, uh, I'll just read it. Additionally, the following provisions shall be required for new construction for each fossil fuel space heating or service water heating appliance installed. Yep. Thanks, Joe. 
Um, I, I didn't have access to your motion, so I may have missed that when the screen popped up. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, with that, we'll take a roll call. Uh, the motion on the table is to strike 401.3.6. That's simple enough and capture it, Micah. C 401.3.6, just for clarification. C 401.3.6, thank you. Okay. Okay, Shell Anderson? Nope. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Bayrother? No. Justin Borgalt? No. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? Yes. Tom Handy? Yes. Roger Haringa? No. <clears throat> Matthew Hepner? No. Craig Holt? Yes. Ty Menser? No. Ben Omura? No. And Pete never showed up. Katie Sheehan? No. Motion fails. It is. Five to eight. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, go ahead. Yeah, and I think uh, someone on staff sent out the list of motions. Um, so I don't know if that satisfies your you know, how, how you can restate a motion, Tony, or not. Um, uh, that's what I was just reading. I was trying to kind of get my head wrapped around that. If if your motion is to include Ben's items, is that included in this? Yeah, my motion is to, and I'm going, is to include the items in Ben's list, in my list, and then I will amend my motion to also include the two items that were sent slightly later and those are about uh 503.4.6 and this is just clarifying that you can use the fossil fuel path so there were a couple of <clears throat> uh a couple of entities that suggested that um there were some issues with chapter five and so these are meant to address those saying that you can in fact use the fossil fuel path to meet any heat pump requirement in, in chapter five. So that's the my amended motion. So it includes Ben's stuff, my original stuff, and then these two additional clarifications. Okay. Uh, quickly, um, going on the email. Hold on, let me read the next email. Is Ben's item, the, the WSECC CR102 editorial item attachment that was sent, Annette? Yes. Okay, got it. Okay, understood. I'm going to do some copy and pasting to try and get this into one document. Okay. And second. just, just, just to ahead. be clear, there's lots of little things in here. Um, these are not big items that are going to drastically change the in, the intent or the the effect of the code these are just you know having lots of people look at them with a lot of detail means there's lots of little things and a lot of these are, are really editorial but uh, in asking Krista uh, she preferred to just make them part of a motion even if they're largely editorial just to avoid any um anybody saying they're not editorial so that's 
Thank you. Uh, ben, go ahead. Um, I, maybe, uh, Joe, I, I think when you first stated the motion, um, you included the HSPF items, which are part of the residential energy code um, changes. So I, I think we might need to um, either make an amendment or change your, your motion to move those out of to the next agenda item for the meeting. Sure, yeah, I did not intend to update the residential code in this in this motion in any way. Got it. Okay. So I guess I amended my motion, so the maker of the second should probably agree to that as well. Yeah, I'm fine with that, thank you. Okay. Um, and then last item, since uh, Chris has got it up on the screen, um, Joe, would you need to strike out the last revision to see 503.5 .5, um, with the amended text? I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, uh, could you repeat that? So one one of the items we discussed uh, yesterday was removing the reference to um, C four one point three within uh, the exception to C five zero three point five. Yep. But with your latest amend like amended item to five zero three point five, um, maybe we I would I guess I would offer a friendly amendment to remove um, that edit. That's, that's friendly amendment. I'll accept that. Okay. Does the second accept? Yeah, I'm good with that. Thank you. Okay, Jay, go ahead. Thank you. I have a question for, for Chell as I compare the motion to my notes. Coker Amendment 6, um, updated the credit tables. And one of the questions I had asked in September when we were looking at option one and option two is that there were some differences with the credit tables. And my understanding of Coker Amendment 6 is that uh, dealt with those discrepancies. Um, it's the way that I read your motion, Coker Amendment 6 isn't um, part of the motion currently. And just wondering if that is a deliberate decision um, given the credit table update. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Spent a lot of time going back and marking up both tables and seeing which one was better. And what it came down to was um, the, uh, the credits were more clear. There were not TBDs in the option one table. Uh, the number of credits, the discrepancy was small. So for everybody's benefit, there were two agencies that did the modeling for the fossil fuel compliance path table credits. And those two, they worked independently, but they came up with almost exactly the same numbers. Um, and the one uh, in option one in the CR-102 was based on uh, one entity. And uh, let me step back. So there, the proponents of option one and option two discussed uh, and put similar numbers, the same numbers in their amendments. Um, however, the tag uh, towards the end suggested that we use the more conservative numbers. And so those were put into the option one table. Uh, the option two table has, it's only for a couple of building types and it's only a, you know, a, a small adjustment in the numbers, but it's got slightly different numbers in it. And so it was intentional. Um, I, I went back and forth on it, but it was intentional to keep it, keep the option one table because it was already in option one and wouldn't require a lot of um, logistics. Um, but from option two, I did want to include the high efficiency gas water heating credits because that was the main difference between the two tables. Um, option two had some extra lines in it that were TBD and were eventually removed. And so that was a bunch of uh, strike throughs and, and complexity that I, I didn't think the council really, really needed to deal with today. Um, so despite what you see in front of you, you know, this is a, this is, is trying to be the, the cleanest um, update we could, that I could. Thank you. That helps tremendously. 
Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I uh, am going to request that um, we've had a motion with four emails and a couple attachments. I really feel like in order for me to vote one way or the other on these, I need to have a real clear understanding of what is included and where. Um, you know, Ben and Chell have both been talking about, well, not this section, not that section. So I almost feel like I need to have Krista or somebody go through and highlight on the screen what is and is not included in this proposal before I can vote on it. I'm happy to walk through the changes if that's desired. Yeah, I just, I mean, I, Michelle, I think so are all of those on the list and, and, um, cause again, I've got all of them pulled up, <laughs> but, uh, there's been amendments. And so I just need to be real clear what exactly we are modifying. Sure. And, in, in a lot of the like three through 12 here are largely editorial or clerical. Um, but I'll, I can go through them one by one if if that's if that's what the council wants. In my opinion, Shell, it's it's as much controversy as you know. Are what are we changing? Uh, we need to understand. I think it would be good for us to go through one by one. I'm not wanting to extend this any longer than we need to, but I think for clarity, it would be really wise to do that. I guess maybe Damon goes and then I okay. launch into it. Damon, go ahead. Yeah, Jill, I'm 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 concerned. I'll echo what Roger said that all of these, this is quite a considerable number of amendments. Um have you mentioned a couple of agencies that have done the analysis? I don't know if we're talking about ecotrope and, and uh RMI, but has has PNNL looked at this to see what kind of impact these changes will have as far as energy efficiency? PNNL was one of the two entities. Um, PNNL was one of the two entities uh, that, that did, did the updated the table credits. And um, so, yeah, they, they had a, a strong hand in making sure that the fossil fuel path, the heat pump path were equivalent. Um, the other entity, I am not remembering right now, does anybody from the tag remember that other entity? Um, but yeah, then the two entities that independent modeling came with the same, almost really close to the same numbers, which is, I guess it's not surprising because they're both good modelers, but it's, I think it's indicative that we have equivalent energy performance between the fossil fuel path and the heat pump path in the commercial code. Yeah, Cause I'm, I'm also con concerned that amendment one from Coker uh, reverses language that the TAG and MVE committee approved that allowed electric and gas hybrid heating and therefore is a major change to the CR 102. But you know, as we discussed earlier, we didn't want to have any major deviations. So. That's all I had. Roger, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to real quickly state that uh, the number of changes here does not concern me. Anytime you have a complex code and it has gone through this much scrutiny, um, you're always going to have these editorial changes. And to be honest, it's a real benefit for us to go back and do that so that these are all of these are picked up now to make this code as I think Katie said, as best, the best code that we can come up with today, uh, make sure it is as usable as possible for everybody. So those do not, the number does not concern me. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, given our discussion on HB 1042, I'd like to move to amend the last sentence of C501.1 to state that unaltered portions of existing buildings used for residential that received a certificate of occupancy at least three years prior to a permit application for residential uses should not be required to comply with this code. And to add an exception to C503.3 stating that for buildings that were received a certificate of occupancy at least three years prior to this permit application, any space that is converted to a group R dwelling unit or portion thereof from another use for occupancy. And the context of those uh, is an email that Stoyan uh, sent at 1145. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second from Ty. And briefly, the uh, the changes from what we discussed during our work session incorporated uh, Micah's feedback on reverting to the original language on use for residential and reflects Chell's feedback of the um, conflict in C505.3. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jay, would you like to speak to that further? Okay. Ty? No. Okay. Uh, discussion? Um. Go ahead, Joe. Yes, to, to Micah's earlier point, uh, unaltered portions of existing buildings used for resident used for residential occupancy. Do we need the word occupancy in there? Uh, in the first yellow section, I, I don't want to speak for Micah, but Micah had something to say about that. I thought. I think it was purposes, residential purposes. I thought. Yes, I believe that's what the legislation says. I'd accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay. Uh, Ty, are you okay with that amendment as the second? Yes. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. With that, we'll do a roll call. The motion is to move to amend the last sentence of C. 501.1.1 to state unaltered portions of existing buildings used for residential that received a certificate of occupancy at least three years prior to a permit application for residential uses shall not be required to comply with this code and add an existing, excuse me, and add an exception to C503.3 stating for buildings that have received a certificate of occupancy at least three years prior to this permit application. Any space that is converted to a group or a dwelling unit or portion thereof from another use or occupancy. Uh, Chell, go ahead. Yeah, so this is an amendatory motion to the, the main motion. That's correct. Okay, cool. And Mr. Chair, your uh, restatement didn't reflect the ref friendly amendment that we just discussed. Unaltered portions of existing buildings used for residential purposes. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thanks for catching that. Damon, go ahead. Just to clarify, is this this is an amendment to the amendment? Is that correct? That's correct. Roger? Uh, yeah, the exception is to 505.3.3 or 505.3. Trying to read it correctly. It's it's to five oh five point three, the the main correct. It should be to five oh five point three. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Okay. Anything further from council? Micah, go ahead. And um let me explain the exception of 503, 505.3 again. If it, you're stating that a building that has received a certificate of occupancy in the last three years doesn't have to comply at all with 503, is that correct? Or 505.3, is that correct? Just to make sure. That'd be my understanding. That's the intention. Okay. So, 505.3 contains item two, which says anything that's converted to a group R 
And then the exception is if you've got a CFO at least three years prior, then you don't need to bring it up to full code compliance for all those ones. You still have to comply with lots of other stuff, but 5.3 doesn't apply directly. So this exception should be explicit to item two, not to all the other spaces as well. Because that's what you're stating in that first, uh, or the first part of that exception. So if you're converting from an F to an S or a U or other than that, if it's received a in certificate of occupancy the last three years, it doesn't have to comply. That's how I read that exception even though you're indicating, Chael, that it only applies to item two because that's what is C501.1.1. Well, I guess it probably applies to everything. The The legislation doesn't talk about FSU, so the legislation probably has the exception to all of 505.3 now that I'm thinking about it. Sorry, I was a little myopic earlier. So, so would it seem that the exception now is exceeding the scope of legislation as well? That would be my understanding, since it technically applies to item two of 505.3. I, I, I don't understand how it, it exceeds because the legislation, at least, oh, I should bring it up, but um, says anything converted to R, converted to R doesn't you know require a full upgrade um that's not how i read it item i believe it's 2g of the legislation says required unchanged portion of an existing building used for residential purposes to meet the current energy code based on solely on additions but the exception now to c505.3 says that any f s or u which is not in the legislation as long as it has received a certificate of occupancy the last three years, would not have to be brought up to any sort of compliance. I, I, again, I just believe it exceeds the scope of legislation. We could look at the legislation and others could maybe interpret it differently, but I believe exception to 5053, the way it is written, exceeds the intent and, and what we originally talked about. That exception only applies to item two. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Um, my intention in crafting this, and I appreciate you calling this out, Mike, is the uh, text after the comma was to limit it to section two. If there's um, language that would be better to meet that goal, um, I, I'm open to uh, to suggestions. You could probably eliminate the stuff after the comma in that sentence and put the exception after number two. That's not the best path, but if folks are looking to approve this and capture what was brought up, um, I want to say Eric Vanderman, I think somebody mentioned that. That may be a path forward, but I'm not sure if that is clean either, but it is an option. And the sentence stops after or portion thereof, Micah, for the exception. Is that what you were saying? Yes. Why wouldn't item three under 505.3 apply in the legislation? I think it would. Sorry, Shell, that I missed that. Well, I don't know. Two and three are almost identical. Yeah. Kind of I, <laughs> yeah. I was noticing that. That's why I was thinking. 
that it would be for all of 505.3 because I, I mean, the legislation is not perfectly clear in terms of the intent. Would it help to just specifically refer to the exception, you know, to say something like for buildings that have received a certificate of occupancy at least three years prior to the permit application, 505.3.2 and 0.3 do not apply? I think what's on the screen is is as good as we're going to get today. Um, I think it's I think it it meets the intent of legislation and is clean. Could we wordsmith it a bit and make it perfect in a few hours, maybe? Um, but I think it meets the intent of legislation and is code language. Okay, I'm, code language. I'm seeing this now. Okay. Um, then I would like to change my amendment to reflect what's on the screen as a friendly amendment. Okay, Ty. I second. Excellent. Brian, did you have something? Did, did you ask me? Yes, I, I saw you yes. had your hand up. Yes, uh, uh, I, I want to clarify or make it more com confusing. I'm not sure yet, but... Uh, when this bill was developed, we had the several uh, we had several discussions with the sponsors of the bill, and I, I I thought the intent was to exempt the unaltered portions. And when I read the exception, it doesn't really say that. So I don't very often I don't agree with Michael. But I think I did agree with him uh, on this time. The exception uh, technically may create more confusion than uh, uh, you know helping uh, uh, to clarify the intent. So uh, C501.1.1 reads all right, but the exception reads reads differently contrary to the intent of this bill. Also, uh, uh, item three under C505.3 exception three is incomplete. It should say any group or dwelling unit or portion thereof permitted prior to July 1, 2002 that is converted to a commercial use or property or, or rather or occupancy. So there's a bit missing in there in exception three in terms of the text. Just okay. to give credit where credit's due, Eric Vandermeer email, emailed me that one. Okay. Uh, ben, go ahead and we'll go to Micah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I guess like going back to what Jayanna's original letter and what's in section three of the the bill, like it, it seems in within there, like the dwelling units itself are um, required to meet the requirements of the new energy code for, for any new dwelling units created um, by this change in occupancy or otherwise. So I don't, I think there might be some clarification needed to focus in the, this the change for C505.3 to be, again, unaltered portions of existing buildings that aren't part of those dwelling units. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Thanks. Now that I've sat here and processed this some more based on what Stoyan said, I don't think either one of those exceptions or any exception to 505.3 is correct. Because that section or the scoping of 505.3 says spaces undergoing a change of occupancy. That is the, say, office space going to the residential use. And based on the legislation, that does have to meet the energy code or current energy code. It's the unaltered or existing residential that does not. So I'm not sure now that I process this a little more. I think I agree with Stoyan that these exceptions are, are incorrect. Um, and I don't believe they're necessary for 505.3 because it deals with something more specific than the existing unaltered spaces. This is an altered space is what 505.3 deals with. Well, is, is 
is number three not accurate right now as as stated three is not accurate it's basically for units created before 2002 or something like that okay um, so i'm not inclined to call a, a roll call until that's shown on the screen accurately Yes, I don't want to belabor this too much because we have other pressing issues. I, I don't know how to resolve this because I, I don't know that we have consensus and we... Can I uh, jump in for a minute, uh, <clears throat> Chair? Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Derek. Go ahead. Tony. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I've been following this discussion with interest and definitely don't want to belabor this city more. I mean, my understanding of the reason why you're engaging in this conversation is because the legislature has directed the council to adopt by rule um, specific language. And one question I have, and I don't think this has come up yet, is, is whether it would be a, maybe better to just consider tracking the language in the, in the actual bill, in the statute, uh, instead of um, taking the steps to try to weave it into this existing um, code language. And that would just simply involve a copy and paste from it, a, de a, a definition of what existing buildings means for purposes of it, and then uh, and then you're done. Is that a terrible suggestion, or is that an option? I guess we'd have to put it in the right section. Yeah, I understand that that's the issue. And, and, uh, go ahead, Jack. Uh, and I apologize for the missing cut and paste in my email. I've uh, found it in the code. Section three says any group R dwelling or portion thereof permitted prior to July 1, 2002 is converted to a commercial user occupancy. So that doesn't apply. Given what I'd heard from Micah and after further consideration, I do agree that the intent of the bill was that the change spaces do need to meet the code. The uh, discussion the bill talks about unaltered sections. So I'm no longer convinced a change to 505.3 is necessary. Therefore, I'm wondering if the simplest change is just to the 501.1.1. And if uh, it is appropriate to restate my motion to just make that change um, or if that needs an amendment to the amendment. Now that's the chair to make a determination. I think an amendment to the amendment would be the, the appropriate way to go about it. Maybe that's cleaner. Okay, then I'd like to move an amendment to our amendment to uh, Remove any change to 505.3. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Who is the second? My apologies. Micah. Thank you, Micah. Okay. Any further discussion on that from Jay? Okay, Micah. As the second? No. Okay. We'll open that up for discussion. The motion is basically to remove. There that goes on the screen. <laughs> right as I was about to read it. Um, remove the the 505.3 and keep C501.1.1 in the original amendment. Any further discussion? Okay. Okay, with that, we'll do a roll call. Shell Anderson? Yep. Jay Arnold? Yes. Rod Byrother? Aye. Justin Borgo? Yes. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? Yes. Tom Handy? Yes. Roger Haringa? Yes. 
Matthew Hepner? Yes. Craig Holt? Yes. Ty Mentor? Yes. Ben Omura? Yes. Katie Sheehan? Yes. And motion yeah. carries. All in favor, none against. Okay, uh, before we jump back to uh, Chell's motion, let's take point, Sorry, point of uh, order, Mr. Chair. We still have my amendment as oh, amended my uh, on the floor to dispose of. I think they're missing something. After residential, we had occupancy or something in there. It's not there anymore. Yes, right there. Purposes, thank you. There it is. And I believe we eliminated the converted to language and went back to the used for. Is that correct, Jay? Yes. Thank you. That's that is correct. Thank you. Okay, are we good there on that language? Okay. okay, and so what's the what's next on the floor? I think we need to vote on this amendment. Okay, is there any further discussion on this amendment? I'll accept it as friendly if somebody wants to. If if uh, the second on the main motion wants to second that, what was that? I think that's Jay. Oh, you're right. It is me. Uh, if that gets gets us there faster, great. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now we're back to the motion that Jay had made. Is that correct? Are we on the same page? Yep. Okay. All right. Very good. Before continuing with that, because Joel, I think you were going to kind of go through some of these uh, based on some uh, direction that that uh, Roger had brought up. Uh, let's take a ten minute break and then let's come back. So let's come back at uh, twelve twenty seven. Okay, we'll call this meeting back to order. And Dame, I believe you had your hand up. Yeah, I don't recall what it was for. Go ahead and continue on. I might remember. My apologies, Damon. Sorry about that. Um, One out of ten, then. Okay, I'll go ahead. Okay, do you want me to launch into? Please do. Okay, and um, please stop me if I'm going into too much detail or not enough detail. Um, <clears throat> so the first one, uh, the effect of year, I think is just editorial. Um, the Kai Jennings uh, the 2A here update from 10% to 5% footnote B. So we updated this table. <clears throat> so EPCA specifically allows 5% efficiency improvements for gas fired or, or EPCA covered appliances. Um, and we updated most of the stuff in this table or all the stuff in this table that apply to those appliances to 5% but we did not update footnote B. So this is just making footnote B consistent with the rest of the table 503.4.6. And that is, is it, it was just a, a miss on the, the part of the tag to not update footnote B. So I'm suggesting that we update that and, and Ty caught it. Thank you, Ty. 
Um, the next one is, <clears throat> so when the, when the tag was done meeting, so this is 2B, uh, uh, we realized that there are uh, credits for, um, there's an area weighting method. We knew that already. There's an area weighting method for if you have like a 90% <clears throat> or let's say 80% office office use and 20% retail at the, at the ground floor or something like that, um, then you can area weight among um, or among the C406 uh, credits. So this then went to, well, if you use fossil fuel appliances, can you area weight those as well according to the use? And the answer was yes. And so a, a work group got together that came up with some language for uh, this. And um, <clears throat> they came up with language and it was pretty good. And lots of people thought it was good language. It made in the CR 102. But there's a couple of words that that would make the code clearer if we change them. And that's what another thing Ty uh, Jennings put together. And so this is uh, incorporating that into the code. So it's clearer. Uh, that if, you know, 3% of your building is a, is a restaurant that you don't need to um, calculate that separately. <clears throat> you could just say it's an office building, tiny little restaurant in it or something like that. Uh, the electrical electrification readiness. This is Eric Olnan. Um, and it is changing. So there are four four pieces and I'm going to bring up, can you bring up his letter or uh, do you have that letter? Um, and this is about electric, electrification readiness. I, I can have his letter somewhere. Which one was it? Uh, this is about electrification readiness. Uh, it was a uh, McDonald Miller, um, Derek Ullman letter. I think he's referring to the RFI letter from November 20th. If you click the, li click the link on the uh, written testimony. So it's, yeah, that one. Yep. And so this, let's see, no. Could you bring up, or I'll bring up my, my motion. So it's, C4 1.3.6. Well, it's not it's not all of that. Um, C4 3.1.6. Uh, so if you scroll down to the next page, recommend rewriting item one. So that's uh, the piece we're taking from this. Uh, the piece that I'm recommending taking from this. Um, is CR 102 says for one point three point six. So number one is provide a spare electrical branch circuit to the appliance size to support an equivalent heat pump appliance. 
expand to the branch that they come with. Yeah, so the reason why uh, he suggested this is because you might not put a heat pump in the same location as a gas appliance. Um, an air source heat pump you might put on the roof instead of a, a, a boiler in the basement. So that's the reason why this one is useful. You can put it to, you, you, you as a designer get to decide the future replacement location and it could be outdoors, whereas the boiler might be indoors. Um, the next one is then we get to the Johnny letter, the Johnny Coker letter. And that one, Amendment 1. Um, <clears throat> and this is where I think there was uh, a misinterpretation for the CR 102. Um, the tag made amendments to option two to increase the ability for supplementary heat to be uh, fuel, uh, fossil fuel or electric resistance, um, but did not make modifications to option one to do the same, it, as, I, as I recall it. Um, so this goes back for just exceptions five and seven to the original language which is about um, using electric resistance heating and this uh, as a supplementary heat. And the reason why the parenthetical remark is changed to a non-parenthetical remark is that uh, some of these have internal electric resistance heaters and some of them don't. Um, so, so that's amendment one. Amendment two, uh, Amendment two, if you remember the commercial energy code when we voted on it at the end uh, of the last, you know, about a year ago, um, a little over a year and a half ago, maybe, um, based on the cost benefit analysis, and uh, we made a change at the last minute to reduce the uh, water heating requirement from 100% sizing to 50% sizing. Uh, and that introduced some challenges in um, in understanding what the code was actually requiring, and thus how to meet you know the additional efficiency measures as well as the baseline measures. And so this is language uh, to update that. Number three, the heat pump water heating credit. Um, Charles, since I requested yeah. this, I would say you're going into a little more detail than I was okay. looking for. Um, sure. What I really wanted to make sure I was clear on is between your letters, Ben's, everything that is included in this proposal. I mean, your summary is okay for me, but we've added pieces to it. Some are residential, some are commercial. So I needed to be really clear on what all was included in this particular motion. Okay, I, I'll be briefer than I was. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so amendments one through five in the Coker letter, uh, the heat pump water heating credit, uh, there was a limitation and we identified the tag but didn't, didn't resolve it at the tag level to uh, address systems that were not 24 kW or less. Um, and uh, so to allow this both for the fossil fuel and the main path, um, this uh, has revised language that, that is more inclusive of, of larger systems, be they with fossil fuel supplementary heat in the fossil fuel path or the, um, the non-fossil fuel path. Um, <clears throat> the electric readiness, we've, we've talked a bit about that. Um, in this one, is what I what I mentioned to Micah, which is it specifically calls out it's only for space heating or water heating appliances. It's not uh, it's not for a, a range or, uh, or or other things that that might be a fossil fueled appliances. Uh, the blended system credit. Um, this is a way of so if you had a building and you qualify and you want to use the fossil fuel path, which is what we're creating for this. 
and you want to say, but I qualify for 50% of the exceptions in the heat pump, or I qualify for 50% of the sections, meaning I could use 50% fossil fuel fired equipment in, in the heat pump path. So if you qualify for those exceptions, you get to prorate them based on that. So if half of your building qualifies for an exception, you only have to get half the number of fossil fuel fired credits in the fossil fuel credit table. So it allows you to prorate among those. And for instance, if you put in a service water heating that is heat pump based, but a space heating that is fossil fuel based, you can prorate that as well. So it's it's a way of kind of making it really you know one-to-one -one energy performance. The credit tables, um, I did not uh, recommend adopting that. That's uh, Johnny number six, but I did recommend the high efficiency water heating gas fired credits. And that's that's in option two right now. So it's just copying it from the option two table into the option one table as along with the, the supplementary language that tells you what you need to do to meet the credit. Um, uh, amendment seven is the normalization equation. And that is, so uh, one of the members of the tag, uh, Shane Nillis, noodled on this and came up with a better equation that uh, then was in the original proposal to uh, to switch between the, um, to kind of get the exceptions in here that I mentioned earlier for the space heating and water heating. And then I further refined the equation um, in my motion. So that's that's the Coker letter. Olin letter. Uh, this is really editorial. This is E now. Uh, it, it says, you know, do something in this section, and we're just changing it to in this section 503.4. So it's clarifying that this section is 503.4 and not the entire uh, section in there. And that's where it says, unless specifically exempted in this section 503.4. Um, I'll let Ben go through three through 12. They are almost exclusively editorial, but um, they might have some effect on code language. So Ben, take it away. Sure. Um, so number three is the same as Chell's number one. So I, don't, I think that's redundant and we can probably get rid of that. Um, all right, so new number three is just, again, clarifying the code reference in C401 that two dot two to um, the correct section. Um, number four is again just editorial removing some redundant language from the new C four one dot three dot one section. Um, number five is um, changing the reference to be um, the correct code section reference. Um, number six is what I, what I mentioned earlier regarding the um, removal of the term utility from the electrical readiness section portion of C four one dot three. Um, number seven is um, something from Kevin Duell who mentioned noticed that the terms being used in some of the new uh, equations in C four six dot two dot five needed to be aligned. So that, that made sense, stretching that. Um, and then number eight is going into C503.4 uh, to change the stated range of applicable sections from uh, to include C503.4.6 for, this is regarding mechanical equipment and it's just I think it was just something existing in the code language which needed to get up updated to encapsulate all the relevant sections. Um, number nine was um, similar, just a code reference section update. Number 10, this is regarding um, replacement of like equipment. So for, um, we have the same language in the proposed the CR102 for um, both 
um, space heating as well as um, service hot water heating appliances. And the language used in those is a little bit different. So it, it made sense to use a language that's in C503.5, which is using um, the phrase heating equipment with equipment that is the same type and, and nature of the equipment rather than what's in um, C503.4.6, which is like for like heating appliances. So that definitely felt like the description in C503.5 made more sense and made sense to align them. And then finally um, in here is number 11, which is uh, to reference the correct section for hydronic coils um, in C503.4.6.1. Kind of blew through those. Let me know if there's any additional review needed, but I, th I think they were all good catches. And again, like Joe mentioned, we have a ton of experts going through these code sections in pretty fine detail, and you're going to find these editorial items pop up, which is, it, it's helpful to get these corrected at this stage. Thanks. Yeah, and then the the last two, A and B, on the screen in front of you, that is just to make it painfully obvious that if you find a section that requires you to do it, if you use a heat pump, you can always just head to the fossil fuel compliance path and get there that way. Now, there are lots of other exceptions under 503.4.6 and 503.5, so you don't necessarily need to do that. But if you ever come to an untenable situation where you need to use a heat pump, <clears throat> and I haven't found such a situation, but if you did, you would be able to uh, head to um, the fossil fuel path. So that's that's both of those. And 503 is uh, root, uh, alterations to buildings. So that's 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 my my bit. Roger, go ahead. Thank you both very much. I, um, again, I think it was important to go through and make sure we understand the extent. There's a lot of been a lot of conversation about adding this and adding that. Um, so I'm in favor of making all these changes. Damon, go ahead. There's a lot of complexity to, to uh, these amendments or this main amendment. Uh, I would like to get Derek's opinion. Is, have we gone beyond what is substantial? in the CR 102. Yeah, that's, it, it, here's what I can say. So I, I'm, I'm not prepared to lend a, render a legal opinion on, on that issue, uh, Damon. Uh, and and that's not me uh, punting on this, that ultimately at the end of the day, that's the decision that the council's gonna need to make is, is whether, um, how comfortable you are uh, in that space. I would say a, a useful way of for the council to consider whether they think it is would be to to walk through again the requirements or rather the definition of a substantial variance in the uh, 3405 in the Administrative Procedure Act and and from that assess what your comfort level is as to whether or not these are outside of that uh, definition or not. Thank you, that's helpful. Thanks, that didn't sound too helpful when I was saying it, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Is the RCW 3405-340 something that we want on the screen as a reminder to Council before continuing? Anyone need that right now? Say, say so now. Okay. All right. Not hearing any. Okay, further discussion? Uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, quick question. When we vote on this, are we voting to amend the language or amend it and accept the code as amended? 
the motion, the main motion is what we're back to, and it's been amended, but it is to adopt everything in this Word document and send the commercial code into the CR 103 final rulemaking process. So it is to finalize the code for, a, for implementation on March 15th. That's, that's the motion as I understand it. And it's Thank been you. amended to include everything in this Word document that we've been discussing. Thank you. Thank you, Chell, for clarification. Katie, go ahead. So just to kind of um, clarify with the um, CR 3405, what we're, what we're saying is that all the substantive changes that we're making are to comply with EPCA and the Berkeley decision. And then there are other kind of clarifying editorial things that we're also fixing along the way. Is that fair to say? Or is, is everything that we're doing related to EPCA? The, the, can, I, can I jump in real quick on that? Yeah, yeah. Can, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, well, this was a good question, Katie. I want to make sure everybody's clear about what I'm talking about. I'm talking about changes from the CR 102 to the CR 103. Okay. Not the scope of the rules that were proposed under the CR 102. And the CR 102 rules were proposed following the filing of a pre proposal, which indicated that the rulemaking would be done to address uh, potential issues under EPCA or EPCA related. Uh, and and some additional changes have been proposed under through that CR 102 process, which the public had an opportunity to comment on, which you know may or may not be squarely within the scope of the CR 101. But but at least for this discussion here, we're talking about whether there's a substantial difference between that code language which was offered up in the CR 102 filing and what's being proposed here for uh, for approval for the CR 103. I see. Thank you. Sorry about that. I feel like that. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thank you. Good question, Katie. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Jay, go ahead. Thank you. So it appears we're uh, looking to move to final passage. Just some some final final comments on this. Uh, I really appreciate the work of the tags and and the folks that wrote in uh, on this and where we are meeting what we were looking out to do to clarify things around EPCA, open some final open some flexibility in um, uh, allowing for um, fossil fuel uh, fueled appliances and uh, better comply with EPCA. Um, the changes that we have made here, while there are a couple of dozen, I believe that they are uh, clarifications and not big policy decisions. For all the feedback that we got that said, hey, State Building Code Council, you're, you're um, making a policy that disadvantages natural gas. Uh, we are making a policy based on our efficiency mandate from the legislature, and it's the physics that is disadvantaging natural gas, not any policy decision that we're making. And I am uh, comfortable with moving forward where we are today. Thank you. Thank you, Micah, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for putting this together. I do have a question for Derek on the RCW 3405-328, and specifically to the cost-benefit analysis provision in there under Section 5, and it says before adopting any rules by the SBCC or significant legislative rules, do we have to provide a cost-benefit analysis of some level? And if we've already provided one, would we need to provide a modified one? And is that being, and that's for Derek and then for Stoyan, is that if we have to provide one, is one being prepared now to be, you know, finalized prior to the adoption of this? I know that the adoption doesn't occur till it's filed, which is usually a, a few weeks to six weeks from now. But that's my question on the RCW 3504 or sort of 3405-328. Thanks. Sorry, flipping around on uh, buttons here. I'll, I'll let uh, Stoyan and Krista talk to what the process is uh, that the council has followed in the past on what you're doing here. But I mean, that's the right citation, 3405. Uh, no, you just said it, 328. Yeah, sorry, numbers. Uh, it is that provision of the APA which governs the adoption of uh, uh, what are called significant legislative rules. 
And among other things, significant legislative rules have to have a cost benefit analysis process. Um, the, what the statute requires is there must be a, a preliminary cost benefit analysis uh, that is made available to the public uh, at the time of, I think it's at the time of the publication of the CR 102. Um, yeah, this is subsection uh, C, sub subsection C that the agency has to provide notification in the notice of proposed rulemaking, CR 102, uh, that a preliminary cost benefit analysis is available. And then following the notice and comment uh, process and the adoption of the final rule of final uh, cost benefit analysis needs to be made available too. Uh, as I understand it, historically, that cost benefit analysis final one has not been prepared uh, prior to a council vote. And the reason for that is, of course, the council is, um, you know, can take a vote on a whole host of different policies, right? And so the final cost benefit analysis is a cost benefit analysis that's performed on the rule that's been adopted uh, by the council. Um, the, the logic behind the cost benefit, preliminary cost benefit analysis, of course, is that it gives the public an opportunity to review the cost benefit analysis and through the public comment period, offer up comments as to whether or not those, that those cost benefit analysis is, is uh, adequate uh, or you know, offering up its own uh, facts or considerations or opinions of, of a comment or a member of the public uh, with respect to costs and benefits to help inform the decision uh, of the council as it makes that final determination. Did, did that answer your question, Mike, or did, was I off base there? No, I think you're getting there. I, I, I guess the question is, do we have any, any cost benefit analysis in relation to this other than the preliminary one that was done for the original code adoption, not this modified rulemaking? Well, I'll turn that over to to Chris. Sorry, Krista and Stoy, I'll put you on the spot. We have the cost ben the preliminary cost benefit analysis for this uh, 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 rule, for this uh, proposal, for this package, for for both codes, uh, and uh, we also added all related comments uh, related to cost benefit analysis. It was a short comment period this time, but you you have everything available, and as Dirk said what we've been doing uh, in the last uh, uh, years, and Krista will correct me if something different was happening before me, but to the best of my understanding, uh, the council is required to uh, comply with uh, 3405-328 effective, I think it was sometimes in 2018. Uh, so after the council votes on the CR-103 and directs staff to file the CR-103, uh, staff makes the changes uh, if there are changes to the final cost benefit analysis. Uh, since I've been here, I haven't seen a, a, a rule that was considered significant. So if we have a significant variation between CR 102 and CR 103, we need to go back to the same process, file another CR 102 or uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> required documents per the Administrative Procedures Act, which will include, uh, include the cost-benefit analysis. So it depends what the council will decide now, whether or not we need to go back and uh, run the same process if there are significant changes. Yeah, and I, if I can uh, say one more thing on that too, I, I don't want anyone to come away from this uh, discussion thinking that a preliminary cost-benefit analysis is all that's required under um, 3405-328, part of your job today, because this is significant legislative rules. By statute, the legislature has told us that um, the rulemaking that that the agency is engaged in, that the council is engaged in significant legislative rulemaking, um, there are, you must make determinations on the proposed rules that meet the requirements of the statute. And I'm, if, if you can bear with me, I'm just going to take a minute to to for purposes of the record, to read what those determinations are. So when you're adopting a significant legislative rule, which includes the proposed uh, code changes today, you have to uh, clearly state the, I'm sorry, you have to determine that the rule is needed to achieve the general goals and specific objectives, um, determine the probable benefits of the rules are greater than its probable cost, taking into account both the qualitative and quantitative benefits and costs and the specific directives of the statute that's being implemented. 
determine after considering alternative versions of the rule and the analysis that uh, the rule is, uh, sorry, I, I read an extra word there, determine after considering alternative versions of the rule that the rule being adopted is the least burdensome alternative for those required to comply with it. That will achieve uh, the general goals and specific objectives uh, of, of the rulemaking. Determine that the rule does not require those to whom it applies to take an action that violates requirements of another federal or state law. Determine that the rule does not impose more stringent performance requirements on private entities than on public entities unless required to do so by federal or state law. Determine that uh, if the rule differs from any federal regulation or statute applicable to the same activity, that the difference is justified and uh, coordinate the rule to the maximum extent practicable with other federal, state, uh, and uh, local laws. Now, that seems like a heavy lift, right? But that's that's part of what the rulemaking process has been, is designed to do, is to give you the information from the public to help you make those assessments. And when the CR 103 is published, it will include uh, those determinations, reflecting the, um, the feedback from members of the council during today's meeting. And Krista, if I said anything wrong on that, that's that's separate from your practice, jump in because I, I don't want anyone to be confused by this. Oh, Thanks, good Derek. Man. Thanks, Stoyan. Thanks, Derek. I, I, I will struggle to see how, again, the electrification readiness meets those criteria that Derek just read to us. Thanks. Uh, Linda, go ahead. Sorry, Senator Wilson, go ahead. My apologies. I can't hear you, Senator Wilson. It shows your mic is on, but. It looks like your frame froze. Might be some connection issues. We'll give that a minute to sort itself out. Is there any other comments while we wait for Senator Wilson? Uh, Representative Gaynor, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, it, it seems that without a clear uh, net cost analysis, that it, you, you don't have all the the real background, I guess, that you need to make a good choice. And at some point with these energy codes, it seems that we get to a point of diminishing returns. I know that uh, there are, the option is still there, like was mentioned with the the fossil fuels, but at what cost? And, you know, when we're not fully having a clear understanding and, and based on what I've seen, it seems like they're, it's clearly uh, stacked against, you know, using that option. And yet we still say that the option is there. So I, I strongly feel like we need, you should have a good analysis prior to making a decision. Thanks. Todd, go ahead. You know, with the risk of being a little repetitive, I, I just want to again remind everybody that the cost benefit analysis is to achieve a certain benefit. And, and our task is to provide the, you know, the least burdensome, um, you know, cost to do that. The irony here is that in is it, we're adding a fossil fuel path, pathway, you know, and the irony is, is that that is not the, the, most cost-effective pathway to that benefit, but it's not an or; it's an and. So the, this task was was mitigation, um, you know, for, for potential future litigation, and it was to provide an and so that that option was there. It, but the irony is, that it's not the most cost. The fossil fuel pathway is not the most cost-effective. So thank you. Craig, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm in. I find the cost analysis interesting. Historically, in the industry, in the commercial large building industry, we found the 2018 code to increase the cost of building between four and 5%. And currently projections for the for the 2021 code, uh, there's a lot of unknown is between four and 7% increase. And that's not isolating each little thing. That's just telling you that the price of the building is going up relative to the things we're putting in the code. And I don't think the legislature gave us a mandate to increase the cost of building and put contractors out of business. I think all of us are involved in the, in the construction industry and soon we continue this trend 
cost of buildings will be so much that developers and owners will stop building and we'll have to go somewhere else to build. So that's my big concern here is not just the cost analysis, but the result of the code overall. Thank you. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's important when we think about these options and what, you know, that the statement that they just happen to be the most expensive ones to go to uh, fossil fuels. I don't think we need to forget that we are controlling the costs of those options in, in this rulemaking process here. And so when when we say that it just happens to be that way, well, it happens to be that way because of the decisions we're making right now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, so we save tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year in utility costs because we have efficiency. Efficiency has been, according to all the power plans that we do in our region, the cheapest way to meet our energy goals. We don't need to build tons of new power plants like lots of other places because we have abundant energy, but we also have a real strong set of energy codes that gets updated that that leads to efficiency, which means we need less uh, less new energy sources and um, less storage of those energy sources and all those other things. So first cost, yes, very important. Operation cost of buildings and the based on energy use is also important. And if you have inefficient buildings, it costs more to build the generation sources for those buildings. So we need to take into account first cost. We also need to in, take into account operational costs, but we also need to talk take into account, account the cost of new power generation if we have inefficient buildings on the grid. Because power go power costs go up if you need to build lots of new generation. And, and luckily, because we have you know serious investment in energy efficiency, we we haven't needed to build new power generation in our region. I, I, seems like we're getting ready to vote soon on this. I was I was waiting to see if Senator Wilson uh, uh, joined us again. And I'm, I see that our microphone's on again, but I still can't hear anything, unfortunately. I don't know if there's a call-in number that can be used. Damon, go ahead. Could uh, staff point us to the direction where the uh, preliminary cost benefit analysis is? Diane or Krista, are you able to answer that for Damon? Well, it appears, unfortunately, that Stone has the same question. So uh, um, I guess I'm not doing a good job here. So, Krista uh, or anybody else? I found it. I found it under the November 22nd meeting documents, if I'm looking at the correct one. Well, it shouldn't be hidden there anywhere anyway, but uh, we'll work on it. Sorry about that. Roger. Yeah, I have two comments about the cost benefit analysis, and I think that they're kind of general in nature, but I continue to think, you know, we passed this energy code um, a year ago, and we went through all of the cost benefit analysis of approving a, an energy code a year ago that was scheduled to be implemented. We have now just gone through and we have added options. So I have no idea how, how the cost benefit analysis could get worse. Um, you can still do the exact same things that we could have done on the building code that we passed a year ago. Um, you only have more options and those options may be more expensive, but um, as I've heard Chell say, and Todd, I agree, it's, um, it's trying to balance efficiency. It isn't 
necessarily cost. And then I continue to go back. And my second point is I go back to my uh, expertise, which is structural engineering. And there are code changes that happen many times that influence one material over another. Um, I would just suggest the higher seismic loads that we are uh, including in the new code uh, most definitely impact concrete buildings more than steel and make concrete buildings more expensive to build than steel. Yet we pass the uh, increased seismic loads because it was uh, you know based on science. It was in the IBC. Um, so you know I think yes we we need to balance things and in this case it's the efficiency uh, to provide similar efficiencies and. Um, you know, if there's added cost to the um, to the fossil fuel option, uh, I think, as Todd said, I think that that's physics and not necessarily uh, code related. So that's all. Uh, those are my comments. Mike, right, go ahead. Since we're still waiting to see if Senator Wilson can come on. Um, can you I, hear me? The cost. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right. That that did it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I finally figured it out. Sorry. Uh, thank you for waiting. But uh, my question was also, where is the cost benefit analysis? Could you could you email that to us so that we have it available? Because our stakeholders here has have said they haven't seen it. So we're just trying to figure out exactly if it's the proper one or which one it is that directly relates to the changes we're making today. Joanne or Krista, is that? Yes, working commit. Okay. Uh, Micah, go ahead. Thanks. I, I appreciate it. Uh, looking at the cost benefit analysis, there are some. Items that are covered in there, again, I'm going to go back to the electric readiness. That's not covered in the cost-benefit analysis. Those are extras. Um, I, I think that, again, still needs to be removed from this proposal. I support the proposal. I even support the electric readiness ready? as a policy moving Point forward. Order, Mr. Chair, it's no. been no. Uh, addressed by a council vote. You're still voting on it as part of this motion. So it can still be talked about. And I believe it's been brought up in the discussion that Chael just had with the overall proposal. We're discussing the motion on the table, correct, Mr. Chair? That's correct. Continue. Okay. Um, and, and I struggle with some of this too. I understand that we need some of the code changes to occur. What Roger brought up about structural code changes to me, as an enforcement uh, individual, that's a little different. Structural is more life safety issues. You know, if you need something more robust in earthquakes, that's one thing. But needing more robust energy systems in an earthquake, nah, that's not really necessary. Um, but again, I approve moving forward this package. I know there's a lot of work being gone into it, but I believe that the Electric readiness is not part of the preliminary cost benefit, and it's not included. It is, in my opinion, a penalty if you decide to go the gas path. And I believe it's inappropriate, again, based on the EPCO requirements and the issues we're trying to handle. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion? Staff, were we able to get that email sent out? Yes, I sent it a few seconds ago. There it is. Okay. Thank you, Stoyan. Okay.
Okay, so the motion, before we do a roll call, the motion is to adopt into CR 103 rulemaking process, the CR 102 commercial energy code provisions. Option one with the following public comments and modifications. Okay, we have the CR 101, excuse me, C 101.1 update the effective year. Uh, it, is it best for me to go through these? Do we have the document that shows what we're voting on? It's in one document. Staff? From a Robert's rule standpoint, do I need to go over this document or can we say that the motion is as on the screen? Eric, do you have a, a recommendation for that? I don't have an opinion on that uh, yet. I could, we can crack open Robert's rules, but um, I, I guess maybe Tony, you might want to ask members what they, if they have a, a preference i'm guessing they don't want to read all of this yeah, tony you can you can certainly say as on the screen and somebody can object and ask for it to be read again understood okay so we are uh ben go ahead does this have the amended language that uh jay had proposed oh, there it is okay thank you thank you ben Okay, so the motion as is on the screen, that's what we're voting on. This would move it to, uh, this would be the, the CR 103 final rulemaking. And we'll go ahead and do a roll call on that. Unless any council members have an objection to doing it that way. Okay, let's proceed. Okay, hey, Shell Anderson. Yes. Um, Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Bayruther? Aye. Justin Borgold? Yes. Micah Chappelle? No. Damon Doyle? No. Tom Handy? No. Roger Haringa? Yes. Matthew Hepner? Yes. Craig Holt? No. Ty Menser? Yes. Ben Omura? Yes. Katie Sheehan? Yes. Motion carries nine to four. Thank you. Motion carries nine to four. Okay, with that, we'll move to Agenda item number five, which is the 2021 Washington State Energy Code Residential CR 103 vote final adoption. Okay, I'll go ahead. I'll start things off with a motion as well. It is to adopt the CR 102 Residential Energy Code into CR 103 final rulemaking uh, with those two with the three uh, bits down below, A, B, and C. A and B are editorial. C uh, is a change uh, based on comments. So um, A is the, the federal testing procedure changed from HSPF to HSPF2. Um, and so new products that you buy as of this year are rated in HSPF2 values. Um, so we need to get that into the code. It's an editorial clerical thing and a great way to do that because people will buy these based on their HSPF2 value. So this would be adding HSPF2 values in parentheses in the residential credit table. So people would know and code officials would know what they are. Um, Girl, the, can, we, can, we, can we state the motion and yeah. get an explanation during discussion? 
Sure. Okay. The motion is to move the residential code CR-102 into the CR-103 process with the, the three uh, modifications on screen. Okay. We have a second. I'll second. Okay, Ben with a second. Thank you. Okay, Charles, go ahead and speak to your motion. Okay, A, I mentioned B is uh, editorial and C is based on uh, the, this is the R405 energy modeling path um, that is not often used, but um, we have it. And some people say that they use it. So, um, so this is about the baseline uh, heat pump water heating equipment. The baseline for the R405 method uh, in the CR102 is a tier one of NIA's advanced water heater specifications, which I don't believe is a federal minimum. Uh, so this is changing it to what uh, I believe to be the federal minimum standard for a heat pump water heater. That's all I have. Okay, Ben, would you like to speak to your second? Nope, good, thank you. Okay, we'll open it up for discussion. Damon, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'd like to pose an amendment. Uh, it was item number nine in the CR 102 that changed the uh, U value of above grade walls from 0.56 to 0.45. And I would I would uh, speak, I'd like to speak against that change. So I move that we strike amendment number nine, changing the U value table for above grade walls from 056 to 045. Okay, do we have a second? Second. And we have a second from Craig. Damon, would you like to speak to your motion, your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is this is not an editorial amendment, even if the new U value more closely matches the prescriptive wall value of R20 plus five. Uh, there was never a discussion about modifying the above grade wall U table, uh, not at the tag level, not at the committee level, nor at the council level. In 2009, we required homes built prescriptively in climate zone two to insulate to R19.5. Also, we also left the target U values the same for both Washington climate zones at that point in time, 056. What this did was encourage builders and designers to meet target U values by use, using the UI, UA trade-off worksheet, which then later became the component performance worksheet and is now the code compliance calculator produced by WSU. In essence, it taught, it taught builders and designers the effect of the choices they made and to better analyze their envelope as opposed to simply chasing points. For the subsequent three code cycles, 2012, 15, and 18, we've maintained the wall U value of 056 for both climate zones four and five. If you go to Appendix A, there are no two by six wall assemblies that meet the 0 0.045. Moreover, R20 bad insulation is not a product that's made by any manufacturer. It does not exist. Since, since PNNL's incremental improvement analysis showed that we were as much as 18.8% ahead of target for this code cycle, I urge the council to reject Amendment 9 maintain the great above grade wall assembly of 056. I'll also add that a home renovations, excuse me, home innovations research lab report in 2021 calculated the increased cost of construction for uh, adding exterior insulation to their standard reference house at $4,970 and a, a lower annual energy cost savings of 2.5 to 2.8%. The payback on that in climate zone four, which is most of Western Washington, is 103 years. And in climate zone five, it's 78 years. So that's a negative net present value of a 40 year useful life. It costs much more than it saves over a 40 year, 40 year period. Uh, I urge your uh, adoption of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Would you like to speak for your second? Very briefly, it is a change without a benefit. And certainly based on the information Damon has just provided, it's almost a negative benefit. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open that up for discussion for the rest of the council. Carol, go ahead. Yeah, my recollection as to why this was suggested as a editorial is because the tag and council 
included the uh, updated U updated R values, but accidentally did not update the U value to match the R value, and that was a, a clerical mistake. That's my understanding of why the U value uh, in this is considered a clerical error. Is that is that how you remember it, Damon? You know, the discussion was never had. Uh, the first time this came out was with the CR 102, and it was just simply listed as an editorial error. The fact that we set precedence back in 09 by saying in climate zone two back then, you had to do, that was the 11 counties in the Northeast portion of the state. You had to do 20 plus five, but didn't change the U value. It gave the gave people a path to, to analyze your building, do rudimentary modeling, and uh, and look at the changes made, you know, glazing percentages and whatnot. And uh, and I assumed that that was the same path we were taking this time. Never was there a discussion on the fact that they didn't match. It just simply popped up as an editorial change. Micah, go ahead. My understanding is this editorial change would align with the base 2021 IECC table and that factor value there. Um, and I may be incorrect there, but my understanding is this is going to or with the base IECC table U factor for walls. Thanks. Mike, if I could respond to that. Um... It is more closely aligned, but the number is not quite the same. I'd have to pull up the IECC. Again, you know, we, we've relied on Appendix A for quite a number of years. I think that goes all the way back to the super good sense era. But um, the point for it, and it's, it, we're talking the difference between 0.44 or 0.46. It's kind of a random number. Um, again, with the, with the, the, you know, the extra cost and the added benefit, Quite frankly, I'd rather, I'd love to see the twenty point five go away from prescriptive as well, but um, I'm I'm leaving this I'm leaving that there and giving a path for builders to do an analysis, builders and designers, to be able to see you know how they can change their envelope and stay with the point oh five six. Thanks. I was looking at the twenty twenty one IECC table when I made that statement. It's not just a guess. Thanks. Okay, it is four five in that table. It just doesn't align with our Appendix A. Correct. Roger, go ahead. Can I get some clarification from Micah and Damon then? Um, the, Micah, you're saying that in the 2021 IB, IEBC, it is 0.45? Yes. Like, and the uh, IECC 2021 table uh, for wall U factors is 0 0.045. Okay. And then Damon, can you clarify for me, this is in the prescriptive path and you still have the ability to go through and do a analysis? Yes, you can You can uh, use the, uh, it's been renamed so many times over the years. Uh, <laughs> it was component performance, then it was, uh, which I think it's, it's in the component table. So, it allows you to do your envelope analysis with the component table or just simply follow the prescriptive path. So um, this change is for only for the prescriptive path. Although, or are we requiring 0.45 and then you're going to have to go do more to meet the, the criteria? And the... You can simply follow the prescriptive path, which gives you all of the R values. Right. Or you can use the, the component U value table and comply that way. Okay. It takes a little bit more analysis, but it's another compliance path. Any further discussion? Senator Wilson. Uh, thank you. I'm curious, so I'm trying to follow all of this. So um, was this voted on in either a TAG or an MV MVE? Standing committee, <clears throat> the change from the 056 to the 045? It was not. It was neither discussed nor voted on. Okay. So 
that makes it a significant change then, is that correct? And not editorial? It could be seen as that, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, that's my point. The code as we passed it a year ago is at 056. Damon, what, what code section is that? Um, it is. It's table 40212. And if you go to the CR 102, it's item number nine or amendment number nine. Okay. Thank you. And does someone know the WAC reference that reflects last year? I've got it up. Let me see. Uh, it looks like 5111C40222. Oh, I'm incorrect. Hang on. Black section is almost harder to follow than our code. Is it 5111R40211? Go back up a page. There you go. So here's yeah, here's where it exists in the in the CR 102. Um See if I can find it. So up until the CR uh, 102, which I don't recall the date on that. Looks like October 18th, 23. That was the first time that it was changed from 056 to 045. Micah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the WAC in the 2021. It appears that we actually modified the table significantly and broke out various types of wall U factors. So I want to clarify that the 2021 table is similar to the 2018 table where it just has a wall factor, a wall U factor in general and not broken out into multiple components. So I, I don't know where the 056 came from um, for the above grade wall U factor in this new table, because again, it doesn't match the 2021 R402.1. whatever table. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, that to me screens. But yeah. um, Again, we broke out the various wall factors in this table for climate zone five and four that I'm not seeing. Um, we'd have to go back and get the proposals. Okay. So I'm not sure where the 056 came from. And at this point, I'm not sure where the above grade wall U factor came from unless it is aligning with the 2021 IECC table that is specific to or general for all wall U factors. Thanks. I just want to clarify, Damon. I'm yep. looking at different things, but. Uh, want to give you clarity on what I'm seeing. I can respond to that. So first off, 056 has been our above grade wall U factor since 2009. Um, in the WAC, it is WAC 5111R40211. 
and it matches what you see on the screen. Uh, sort of, yeah, yeah, no, it does, it matches. The only other thing that we changed in there was the ceiling U factor. We dropped it to 024 from the 2018. Um, but again, we kept we kept the 2018 above grade wall U factor of 056. It wasn't until October 18th with the CR 102, 102 did that change as an editorial adjustment. And once again, there's <laughs> go ahead. I'm looking at the whack and, and the stuff that's effective until March 15th, 2024 does not match what's shown on the screen right now. I think the only thing that should be It does match what is effective after March 15th. So again, I don't know where the 056 came from or the 045. And I'm not sure if staff can show us the RCW or the WAC rule 5111R40211 for what is currently in effect and what will be in effect. I think, has, has that not been overwritten? I can certainly pull up the 2018 uh, Washington State Energy Code and show that it does say 056. That's correct. The 2021 Residential Energy Code, it says, yeah, you're, you're correct. It says 056. Again, may we see the WAC language for that, please, from staff? And Damon, if I'm correct, or not, sorry, would the correct WAC be 51-11R-40211? That is correct. It seems the PDF might be easier to read. 40211. No, that's the wrong one. That's the wrong one. That's commercial. Sorry about that. Let me see what I can find. It's right above where you clicked. You can scroll down a little bit more. There you go. Yeah, this is the 2021. I'd have to go into mm -hmm. the next section to get the 2018. Actually, Krista, if you scroll up, it says effective until March 15th. But that's the R value. Oh, that's the one above. Okay, gotcha. They swapped the places in the... So this is the uh, 2018. There you go. Micah, does that help you? Yeah, no, it does. I just, that's where it came from. I appreciate it. I, that was the confusion. Um, Okay, any further discussion? Okay, so the motion would be to keep 0 0.056 as the U factor. Yeah, to strike and amendment nine in the CR2 and retain 0 0.056 as the above grade wall U factor. Thank you, David. Okay, with that, we will take a roll call. Uh, Chael, go ahead. go ahead. I do have a question. I've been <clears throat> I've been researching what the tag did and, and all that. And um, I guess from a regulatory effect, Damon, um, if the U-factor table has 0.056 and the 
our value table has five or 10 continuous insulation. What does that mean for people designing and building homes? What they're probably going to pick the the lesser requirement. What it, and what is it? What does that mean? Well, they're going to have to demonstrate that their wall assembly achieves a point zero five six. Um, and again, that's why where the uh, what's now the code compliance calculator has become a real useful tool on that. And it, and it's also the same thing we did in 2009, 2012, 2013. So, um, so it's so it's going to have more people use the component performance or whatever. Hopefully, call it. yeah. Okay, thanks. Micah, go ahead. That that kind of prompted me, Chell. So, if we stick with the point zero five six, would that be less than the base code? Or more restrictive. That's my question. When you if say the base, base code is 0.045. When you say base code, are you referring to the ACC 2021? Correct. The 2021, which is what we start with and then make modifications from, whether we carry them forward or not. That's my question. Are we now less restrictive than the model code in this instance? In the U value table, yes, we would be the same as the 2018 and the codes before that, but only in the U value table. Okay. And that would be my understanding again, why this is editorial is because it's going with the base code, which is where we should start. Thanks. Well, my only response to that is that we went through this process for a year and a half and it's just, it's been changed at the 11th hour. It should have had more discussion. If that's the argument, Damon, most of the time I'll agree with you, but that means we would have to go back and review every editorial change in the CR 102 as posted for that same criteria. Yeah, I think this is the one that has the biggest impact. That's why I'm bringing the motion forward. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, the motion's been stated. Let's take a roll call. Shell Anderson? Nope. Jay Arnold? Yes. Todd Bayrother? Yes. Justin Borgo? No. Micah Chappelle? No. Damon Doyle? Yes. Tom Handy? Yes. Can you restate it, Tom? I'm sorry. I missed it. Yes. Thank you. Roger Haringa? Yes. Matthew Hepner? No. Greg Holt? Yes. Ty Mincer? Abstain. Ben Omura? No. And Katie Sheehan? No. That's a tie vote six to six with one abstention. So. I vote yes on that. Thank you, guys. Motion carries. Um, we have seven votes. Do we need eight? Yeah, for final rulemaking, I think we do. Well, last meeting, we uh, did that only on final, not on the amendments. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, Okay. I suggested at the last meeting that uh, it would be for, for final decisions that are made and not on motions uh, on, uh, prior to that. Okay. Senator Wilson. Thank you. I have a, just a clarification for Dirk. I, I um, am looking back at the APA and that one particular line where it says a final cost benefit analysis must be available when the rule is adopted under the RCW 3505-360. Um, what I received was a preliminary. So did we not just adopt that and we do not have a final, is that correct? Sorry, I'm switching my, you, you do not have a final cost benefit analysis. The, the practice of the, the council has been to, after the uh, votes are taken on the uh, final, at the council meeting, 
than when the rule is adopted in the CR 103 to make that rule uh, or to make the cost benefit analysis. You the formal what you formally have done here is approved a motion to direct the uh, staff to file a uh, CR 103P. So when is it when is it being adopted then? Because this says it's very clear. It says it needs to be available when it is adopted. So at what point is this adopted? You know, there are um, the, uh, I want to be careful here because there actually are uh, questions under the APA about whether the effective date is the adoption date or the, the adoption date is the filing of a CR 103. Mm -hmm. uh, under the, my understanding of the APA is that a rule is adopted when the CR 103 is filed. It's, that is an order of adoption of a rule. So that is when the agency is who's adopting the rule is ordering that the adoption, the rule will go into effect on the date that's specified in the filing of the CR 103. Okay. This I'm looking at the 360 and it says the date the agency ad adopted the rule. Right. So the, the, the custom would be to make a, a, of the council, and I think consistent with the APA, is that that final cost benefit analysis be available on the date of the adoption of the rule when the rule is adopted uh, through a rulemaking order adopting the rule. That is a CR 103P, or CR 103P. Do you think that that's truly the intent? Because it seems to me that you'd want to have the actual analysis done before you adopt a rule. Before, before it goes into effect, you'd want to know what the analysis said. So are we sure that that's what it says? The intent? I, I, I think that there's some good purpose questions there. Remember, Senator Wilson, most agencies are not governed by governing boards. And so the fact that mm -hmm. the, you have a council board that's taking votes is different than, say, like DSHS or other agencies mm -hmm. who uh, adopt rules through, um, you know, the agency uh, governing official. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a there's a, a delay there in this regard. All I can say is that under the APA, an order adopting a rule is the filing of the CR 103. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Chell, you have a motion on the table. It's been seconded by, remind me. Me. Uh, thank you. Yep. Um, is there any further discussion on that? Damon, go ahead. Just real briefly, I'm very concerned that we're still uh, running afoul of EFTA. Um, I'm concerned that the new tables 406 make it extremely difficult to comply as a home builder. And uh, as a result, I'm voting no on the motion. Tom, go ahead. Same concerns, and you know, I've been to the table. I tried to build a, a mock house and found that it would take everything that the table has to offer in order to have barely enough credits to, um, to the escrows. You know, so now that you know, complying with the different tier levels of, of uh, heat pumps is an art. Tom, I, I, I want to do your time justice. It's just that your mic, um, is not coming through real clearly. And so I can hardly understand that. I don't know if it's coming through like that for everyone else, but I want to make sure you're heard. And so if you can um, maybe try and adjust that or. Is this any better at all or is it the same? It's see. the same, it's pretty scratchy. It's coming through kind of muffled and scratchy. It sounds like a bandwidth issue. You might just drop your video for the for a second. Okay, is this mic any better? That's better. Oh, okay. Well, let me let me see where I was. I I guess I was at the same point, um, you know, in my thought process um, as far as this being extremely difficult to to build a residential house using that table. Um, you know, over here I've shopped around for heat pumps, you know, in the cold weather heat pumps, and I found that um, they 
they won't honor a warranty without providing some sort of auxiliary heat, which kind of already bump, then bumps you down um, in the tier levels, as I understand them, of the heat pumps um, and what what you can do. So I find it is just going to be way too expensive. I think it's going to hurt affordable housing tremendously. Um, I think that it's going to hurt small business. You know, if you got a small builder that's building, you know, maybe three or four homes in a year and if the market doesn't support having houses that cost 30 to 40 thousand you know over here that can be up 10 percent you know of the average cost of a home um you know and if you can't build one of those he's way past the minimum threshold or the maximum threshold of of harm you know that would be calculated using uh the spreadsheet so i don't know i just I think there's better ways to do a lot of this. I think that there's some market way uh, incentives that can be given. I think there's, you know, the marketplace can take care of a lot of this stuff. And I just think that cramming this down everybody's throat is is a pretty tough deal for me. So I'm going to vote now. Any further discussion? Bill, go ahead. Um, I'll just briefly repeat something that I said earlier, which is that this is the same credit table and system types and energy normalization table that we had a, a year ago in the CR-102. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, Chell, will you restate your motion so we can take a, a roll call? Sure, the motion as amended is to uh, move the CR-102 residential energy code into the CR-103 uh, process and incorporate the <clears throat> editorial comments A and B, um, as you see on the screen, as well as the comment C, the R-405 baseline system, changing that to a, a federal minimum system. And then as amended, it also includes uh, using 0 0.056 for the above grade U ball factor. Okay. All right, with that, we'll do a roll call. Okay, Shell Anderson. Yes. Jay Arnold. Yes. Todd Bayreuther. Aye. Justin Borgault? Yes. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? No. Tom Handy? No. Roger Haringa? Yes. Matthew Hepner? Yes. Greg Holt? No. Ty Mincer? Yes. Ben Omura? Yes. Katie Sheehan. Yes. Motion carries 10 to 3. Thank you, Krista. Okay. With eight minutes to spare. We got through five agenda items. Uh, with that, motion to adjourn. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Much appreciated. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, everyone. Good work. Good work, Mr. Chair.